Welcome back to the Comics Aficionados Live. We're here on Think and Critical YouTube. Hope everyone's having a decent week. Obviously, it's been a tough time within the comic book uh, community and all that stuff, but we do have some interesting stuff to talk about. We're going to focus in on some Punisher today because we have, uh, in many people's opinion, the greatest Punisher writer of all times, Mike Barron. How you doing, buddy? Doing good, thank you. So you've got, uh, obviously, all the accolades with Star Wars, Punisher, Flash, all that stuff, but you've got another project coming up very soon. Nexus Scourge. Now, a lot of people like Nexus. You won a lot of awards for that character. Yes, we did. And what, what is it about Nexus that you think really drew people in and, and made the character really special? Uh, I think it's the depth of storytelling, not to mention Steve Rude's uh, earth-shattering art. Yeah, that's that. I, I, I was lucky know. to hook up with the dude. He's one of the greatest artists who ever lived in his uh, art, which... Uh, uh, owes a lot to uh, Jack Kirby, is is still sui generis. There's no mistaking him for anyone else. But also the depth of the storytelling. Uh, I've made uh, Horatio Hellpop a fascinating three-dimensional character. In fact, I, I think all the characters I've introduced in Nexus are three-dimensional. Uh, uh, they're interesting. They're interesting in what they say and what they don't say. I... I try to avoid cliches, and I try to avoid too many words. Uh, and I think that I've hit just the right balance between pictures and, and words uh, that make the comic an engrossing experience. My goal with everything I write is to drag the reader into the narrative to the exclusion of all else. I want to disappear as a writer. I don't want him to think about uh, well, this is a, a work of artifice that somebody put together to entertain me. I want him to live that adventure so that he resents any intrusion that breaks his concentration. And I think that I've been getting better at that. And, and that's one of the keys to Nexus success. That's awesome. So when does that actually launch? There's a link in the video description if you want to sign up so you'll be notified when it's happening. Yes. Uh, and if you do it before we... Uh, uh, launch, which we're going to do in a week, uh, you get a free art card. Very nice. Is it by you or is it by, by the artist? It's by Kelsey Shannon, who's the artist Ooh, on this. Nice. And Kelsey yeah, Shannon yeah. is an artist who uh, is world-class. I mean, his work is just brilliant. There's, a, there's a, a, enough art on that Indiegogo launch page uh, that people can get an idea of what he what he looks like, but those who are unfamiliar with him, but this is going to blow their mind. Uh, Kelsey penciled, inked, and colored everything himself, uh, and it's it's just world class stuff. It's outstanding. Very nice. Cannot wait for that one, and uh, really appreciate you coming on here, Mike, and hanging around with a bunch of bozos like funny books. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, we're going to have a little bit of fun here. Uh, Bozo number one that loves the funny books, I guess, is, is Sully, the Sultan of Soup himself. Uh -huh. Are you still cooking? Yes, I am. I'm cooking right. I just I made cheeseburgers for breakfast. I wanted a to, to, cheeseburger, to, cheeseburger, 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 and hot black coffee. It's a wonderful American breakfast to spend talking about an American invention, the superhero comic book. Is that a little I, Gruyere I, on there? What kind of cheese is that? American, American, white cheese. American. I love. Yeah, I love it. Extra American. <laughs> Why is your why is your cheese so exclusionary, Sully? Yeah, Wait, like how all these my, shows lead down the road of privilege. food. One it's way or another, these shows come to food, no matter what. <laughs> Everywhere it comes full circle. It's cheese. Like everybody, okay, food. just get over it. <laughs> <laughs> what? Whose cheese reigns supreme? Did you get a bag to your comic book shop this week? Did you get a, a brown paper bag? I did not. I, I have a pull list now, uh, so I'm going to oh, go wow. next week. I didn't get. Yeah, I just work's been just like. Get, you know, getting to me, but um, but I do have a stack of funny books to show when we do recommendations because I do go usually every week to my to my local comic book shop, and I am just yeah I'm I'm a reader. That's what I do, and I I spend money at my LCS, my local comic book shop, and I get my supplies there. So get your supplies at your local comic book shop. You need bags and boards, don't you? One thing I've noticed of late, Eric, is that you've been frustrated a little bit with the crowdfunded scene. That, that there's bit. been a few issues there. And obviously, Mike is going to be doing uh, Nexus, I believe, on crowdfunding. What mm -hmm. are some of the issues that, that obviously Mike won't have? But if you wanted to air them out and make sure that, you know, uh, you didn't have any issues there. 
Well, no, my, I guess, my, you know, I'm I'm not going to name names or shame or no, 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 just, just uh, but yeah, no, yeah. I'll, I'll talk in general. You know, my biggest gripe was like reaching out to us to a creator using the IGG internal uh, messenger thing because I didn't want to ask a question like this over Twitter. You know what I mean? And they never got back to me. And it's also a late book too, so it's like, you know, like I don't care too much about lateness because it ends up being really good quality. Like you know, across the board, I've always, I think I've been satisfied with everything I've got. Like this week alone, I ordered Rob Hunter's uh, Death Raider, Billy Tucci's St. Patrick's Day uh, book, and um, and um, yeah, just uh, I, I still invest in these things. I I feel like a patron. I'm a blue collar patron of the arts. It's a wonderful feeling. I think absolutely. That'll never every, happen with my parents. Every one of our books is ready when we launch, ready mm. to go to the printer. Damn. Nexus Scourge is finished. It's ready to go to the printer. We deliver, we deliver on time or ahead of time. And if people have questions, you, you readily answer them. You don't ignore your, your, your backers, right, Mike? Right. Absolutely. This would be Ooh, almost thank you. Well, very nice. So it should be no problems there. Very, very awesome that you're doing your books ahead of time, because I think that's a lot of the, the frustration that people do get is with the lateness. Then uh, who else we've got? We've got Motorhead himself. <laughs> we've got 32 flavors of Nick Wise. How are you doing, Nick? I'm doing great. Happy to be here with you, the dudes, and of course, having Mike on. I mean, I'm I'm a lover, especially of the more indie side of Mike, you know, the Florida man, the Nexuses of the world. So it's going to be awesome to talk shop with him and also awesome to see the aficionados chat here Saturday morning. So I'm ready to be like Motorhead and play rock and roll. Very nice. And uh, Nick and I are doing currently like uh, the Comics Guilds where we're going through uh, the middle world stuff beginning to end as well as planetary from warren ellis planetary and after that out. we might be doing new frontier oh new frontier at least that's right. an well, idea hey, let's go but obviously you got to do the patreon there's a link in the video description for that really having a lot of fun with nick on that one. we've also got arid sparrow in the, in the chats is that a batman animated series church oh batman mask of the phantasm baby mask oh the phantasm. it's the movie yeah, I saw this. So I was walking around with Max at LA Comic Con this year, and uh, there was a shirt booth, and they just had that one right up front. And I was like, well, that's going home with me. No problem. But. <laughs> <laughs> so How you been doing, month. Aaron? I, I know uh, you, we finally got the word out that you're working with uh, Mr. T Bear. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm working on uh, on Black and White Volume 3 with Art T Bear. I'm co writing that with him. Um, it's, uh, it's really exciting. It's a really fun story. I think that uh, people are really going to enjoy it. And uh, yeah, just a lot of stuff going on. So I've got that. I've got the Street Fighter book um, that uh, I did for uh, the, the, yeah the Yuri Han short story that I'm doing in the uh, Game Gals number one for Udon. Uh, I'm working on a bunch of uh, you know, a bunch of editing a bunch of scripts for different people that are in the independent space uh, that haven't announced their projects yet. And uh, we're wrapping up issue one of Brotherhood of the Wolf, which is a uh, survival horror story set during the Crusades. So, uh, that, like, just a lot of a lot of really cool stuff coming together right now. Also, um, I need to issue a retraction. Uh, Wes and I did a video where uh, I said that um, I believed that Jason Pearson had uh, had ended his own life uh, at the hands uh, after uh, you know a month or so after some bullying that he'd received online from various comic professionals. Uh, that was the story at the time, and I never really heard the update. But apparently, that was incorrect. Uh, apparently, he did pass away from a stroke. So, uh, you know, apologies to uh, to everybody involved, even the people who you know kind of don't deserve it, but uh, I was wrong about that. So just want to make sure I say that. Very nice. Yeah. Jason Pearson. He was a, he was a good dude. Really good artist. Yeah. Just, Jesse awesome. Snyder and I worked with him on uh, one of Jesse's books called six issues. And uh, he did, he turned in a, just a gorgeous story for us. Um, had a really good time working with him. How long was the book? Was it seven issues? <laughs> no, it was, uh, it was actually only one book, but it had six oh. different stories. In, yeah, six different stories. I've in it. Got you know, you. So, yeah, each one tackling like a different uh, societal issue, but in a really creative and uh, non-preachy way. Oh, and last but not least, we do have Doc who's having dog problems. What's going on, Doc? Uh oh, no, dogs are just being wild occasionally because um, that's what dogs do when I need to you know, be on a show. Yeah, yeah. Well, you and I obviously were recording our uh, video this week. We're going to review Deadpool number one, and I'm, I've always got these these dogs outside my house, and they get very angry on Fridays. Yes, well, or that's Saturdays, because yeah, you have all the uh, all the bar crowd. That's true. 
that that annoys them. These are just they're just being assholes. There's a difference. <laughs> So everyone thinks like you're this big, uh, rugged guy from Pittsburgh or whatever, but you're a softie. You would never let your dog go outside for more than 10 minutes. Uh, no, he. I mean, he. depending on the day, I mean, sometimes <laughs> they want to hang out there all fucking day. And I'm like, whatever. whatever. I imagine you that want. you've got, it's not a merce. Like, I don't want to like say that you got a merce, but you have a satchel that you put the dog in. Uh, no, no, oh. no. Mostly because the dogs are far too large for that. Oh, yeah. um, I mean. Maybe I could do like the backpack thing where like he's sitting over my head, but yeah, That'd be awesome. And you will not be with us next weekend because no. you're going to be out on business. No, no, you're going to be out on pleasure. Yeah, well, sort of, I guess. Um, girlfriend's uh, daughter's cheerleading squad is at nationals next weekend, so I will be in Virginia for it. So, nice. yeah, way to go. Are you going to wear like a custom jersey? Uh, no, it's that's what I would do. It's <laughs> no, I, I would be dazzled and everything. Nah, no, <laughs> no that's, shame. I mean, <laughs> that, that just seems like a lot of extra work. <laughs> hey, yeah, disco, disco stew doesn't advertise. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, so I'm not going to be able to be here next week. I'm going to be in Virginia and, and um, you know, not going to be able to do any anything next week, which is going to be kind of disappointing. Be there all weekend. Very nice. We do have a couple of uh, people. Lane says for Doc's next review of Suffering, one issue doesn't seem enough. So next up is uh, the first two issues of the X Men relaunch. Um, what are the we'll two X Men? Uncanny X Men. Okay. Maybe well, we as long as are you are you trying to hit me with like the triple crown of shit? Yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> be good. Are those coming out? Are those coming out already? Man, time August. Go August. Like, yeah, came out okay. months ago. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you got to get through oh. the fall of X first. Yeah, because oh, yeah, they're still not on. fucking <laughs> done with it. <laughs> yeah, been that is a long fall. <laughs> yes, I mean, I mean the thing yeah. is, they weren't built up high enough for them to fall that long. Yeah. <laughs> Gallup says, Wes, I sent you a sketch of Venom eating Paul to share with Doc, but it's not very good. I'll be the judge of that. I bet it's amazing. You know what I mean, Doc? Uh, I do not like yeah. Paul. Yeah. Um, you know, Subject matter Sean, makes it fine, Art. Sean, Sean King White. Um, well, which version of Paul? Is it one where he yeah. looks like Sean King? The one well, where he I looks like that. Arnold in Predator? It, or the one that where he just looks like what? Um, uh, fucking... Uh, James, James Tinian, yeah. We shall see. I haven't sent it to you yet, but uh, thank you very much, for, uh, Callum, for reaching out. Really appreciate that. I do want to say thank you very much uh, to our Patreon backers. We got uh, quite a few of them this week. First up, we have Frazetta Hall, who protects people as the Smash, the people of Metro Pulse, at least. Next up, we have Chris Andrews. Thank you very much. He fights uh, crime as Cat's Eye, and he is the protector of Nightshade. Next up, Thank you very much to Robert Reed, a.k.a. the Incarnate Warrior himself, the protector of Fortitude Falls. Also, thank you very much to Arturo Alvarez, who fights as the as the hero named Demon Bane, guardian of the Eldritch Haven. Next up, we have Ursus Bastard, who is the debate dinosaur and protector of Melbourne, Australia. Next up, thank you very much to Norris Ford III, who fights as Triple Threat and is the protector of Triopolis. And finally, or not finally, we also have Brian Warren. Thank you very much who fights as Blue Blade and is the protector of Sapphire City. And then finally, thank you very much to Eric Linden for supporting the Patreon, who fights crime as Funk Force and is the protector of the group. Really appreciate that. Uh, always having lots of fun on the Patreon. If you haven't checked that out, there's a link in the video description. Lots more Aaron and Doc and Jim and Nick and myself and all that kind of stuff. And if you like the audio files and you like listening to this stuff as a podcast, you'll get all the audio files as well if you uh, – if you back a certain tier on that, I really appreciate everybody. But we are mostly here to uh, to talk to Mr. Barron, who happens to be uh, Mike. Would you consider yourself the greatest Punisher writer of all time? I, I think I kind of would. No, uh, but it's it's uh, an honor to hear you say so. So, was there something that really drew you into the Punisher? Did Marvel go? You know what? We need someone to write Punisher. Mike's around. Did they just hand it to you? Or do they know? This is the character for Mike Barrett. Carl Potts asked me to write the book. 
on the basis of my work on the badger. Mm, that makes sense. Uh, my insight was that I approached Punisher as a straight crime comic. And for three years, there were no flying saucers, uh, crossovers with Conan the Barbarian or, <laughs> or uh, the Punisher taking out the Archie universe. There were a couple of Marvel stalwarts who were natural protagonists or antagonists, uh, including Dr. Doom and the Kingpin, who fit neatly into the Punisher's world. But for the most part, he was concerned with violent crime uh, from the top to the bottom. He took on crooked bankers to uh, biker gangs dealing in guns to drug dealers, took on a Jim Jones type. Uh, in fact, that was uh, the third and fourth issues. Uh, but it was uh, my attempt to do honor to the character uh, because I felt that he was a street level hero, not a superhero, but a gritty guy uh, who was uh, a vigilante in the American tradition. America loves vigilantes. Vigilantes help settle the West. Uh, so Punisher stands in the shadow of Dirty Harry and uh, uh, Death Wish. Uh, and real characters like Wyatt Earp, Kit Carson, Davy Crockett, they were all vigilantes. And the reason they were vigilantes is uh, when settlers headed West, civilization trailed far behind. There was no police force. Police didn't come to these communities until years after they were settled. Uh, so men settled things their own way with their own hands. Uh, there were bad guys and there were good guys. And sometimes the good guys stepped up. If you're familiar with the work of John Wayne, you know that's what I'm talking about because many of his movies highlight this in a romantic way, but they're based on a kernel of truth. Or the history of Wyatt Earp. He did not go to. Uh, he did not arrive to actually be the sheriff of that doubt. He wanted to be no, a business that's true. that's true. And then he realized how much crime there was, and the people needed protecting, and he stepped up. That's right. In fact, the whole Earp family was involved in law enforcement. Uh, his brother Virgil was uh, uh, a sheriff before he was. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, he was in Tombstone at the time. But uh, when Wyatt showed up. Uh, his main interest was in playing Pharaoh and, and uh, making money as a gambler. Uh, but uh, he kept getting drawn into law enforcement because his brothers kept saying, come on, come on, you got to help us. And, and so he did. He stepped in and out of law enforcement his whole life. And he, he also had his reputation come with him from Dodge City, Kansas, where he was there with uh, Bass Masterson. They basically cleaned That's up true. the, That's the true. dirtiest cow town in all of America in a couple of years. Yeah, and Bat Masterson followed him to uh, to Tombstone, as did Doc Holliday. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, Bat, I believe, ended up becoming a newsman in New York City, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but <laughs> he ended up uh, writing news articles and stuff. I, I love the Old West, Mike. If we get into this, I'll never be able to stop. But right, I also yeah. love the Punisher, <laughs> and it does feel like, and I'm sure you've noticed this as much as we do, and you might take it even more personally than we do because you do have a close connection with the Punisher, that it almost feels like Marvel – doesn't appreciate the character or maybe they resent what the character even represents at this point. Like there was an article and doc and I did a video on it. And the dude, as far as I can tell, was trying to be honest, but he said like the, the draw to Punisher in the seventies and eighties was a, like a white power fantasy where you were watching Punisher kill down all these minority characters. And I have not read every Punisher book that's ever been written. I'll, I'll freely admit that. But I remember him gunning down a lot of Russians, a lot of Irish dude. Uh, certainly there, there are some black dudes and some Latinos in there along the way. But it certainly wasn't him just like mowing down minorities. But they've created this story about him. And people actually believe it without ever actually reading. Well, your modern social justice warrior is unaware of anything that happened before he, she, or it was born. So it's easy to tell these lies and have people believe them. Uh, because it's a form of virtue signaling, saying I'm better than you uh, because all these other people have faults that are inherent to their skin color. And that's what woke is. It's just thinly disguised malice and virtue signaling. Uh, it's uh, embarrassing what, Punish what Marvel has done with the Punisher. Um, I really, I only know about it from what I see on the internet when people post pages and so forth. Um, but they seem to have lost the reason that people read comics, which is to be entertained. And that's rule number one. Number one, entertain your audience. It's so simple. And they wonder why their books are circling the drain. 
Yeah, recently, Aaron, we had a, a Punisher relaunch where they got rid of Frank Castle because he was the problem. They sent him to an alternate dimension. And now they relaunch Punisher with a logo that's uh, recognizable, but not the exact same. Hardly. And they, uh, they that's put why another, I created you know, Private character. American. Yeah. Uh, take a look uh, in the uh, the Twitter feed, uh, Wes. I posted a cover of Private American, which I uh, produced two years ago, and I did it to show people what the Punisher should be. Mm-hmm. And of course, as soon as uh, we announced that book, the left attacked. Uh, the Daily Coast ran an article saying Mike Barron releases another racist AF comic book. It was written by a woman who's never read anything I had written, mm-hmm. uh, much less Private American, which hadn't been released yet. She's just mm-hmm. going on hearsay and, and the, the Whisper Network. <laughs> Well, and, uh, typical typical Mary Sue level writing. She recording. had her yeah. own book on Kickstarter while she was calling for her minions. Uh, incidentally, her name is Star Minion. Oh, and Minion, wow. Minion was <laughs> calling for her minions to everybody write Kickstarter and, and get this racist kicked off. And she succeeded in having our campaign deplatformed. Uh, but that always works to our benefit because people don't like bullies. Uh, and we got a lot of publicity about that, and and uh, Private American did very well. Will you, 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 you show the cover, Wes? Yeah, I, I've I've got it. Let me uh, let me save it, and I can bring it up. When you take something away from people, you make them want that much more. When you're saying, "Hey, we're going to censor this, remove it," it's going to create spark and injury. Like, hey, what's this thing that's being you no know, taking away from people? It makes them want to know that much more. It's like a reverse psychology. I mean. I, it, and, and also I, 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 because I it's based, like, oh no, I'm not going to read it now because it got removed. <laughs> Who listens like that? Who does that? And, and no, it's just when it's based effect. on obvious lies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I've I've found that um, most writers for most of the ostensibly potentially mainstream media, you can figure out in about the first three paragraphs whether or not they should just be summarily ignored. Uh, because they'll demonstrate their ignorance of comics like we were wes and i you know re-explored a a medium article from 2014 regarding the the mythical facebook poll that that told comic industry that it was you know your your readership's actually 46 percent women and you totally need to change all of your product to to make that um and, and in the first in the first like two paragraphs they referred to jerry conway creator of dc's character the punisher which i'm sitting there going okay i can ignore the rest of this article because you're a fucking idiot well you know the funny thing is headline the daily coast headline began with punisher creator mike barron releases another racist af comic book so i mean star minion is ignorant about what she talks about I'm sure she's never uh, uh, read Punisher or anything I've written. Uh, by the way, after that happened, we contacted the Daily Coast and said, have you read the book? No. Would you like to? Oh, all right. So we made a digital copy available to them online. And as of today, two years after we posted it, they haven't looked at it. <laughs> well, you, can dismiss, you should dismiss any headline that has AF in it because that person is not a reporter. Uh, yeah. Or anybody who has a title that that ends with, and that's a good thing. Any of those, you know, <laughs> stupid little kitschy titles that you see, they're not being written by real p- reporters. You know immediately there is a standard for journalism, and when you see things like that, you know immediately this is written by an activist. This isn't written by a journalist, and I should just dismiss everything that comes after this headline. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's absolutely ridiculous. Indeed. Now you hear a, a similar narrative where people talk about like Batman. Because everybody knows exactly what uh, Bob Cade and Bill Finger were thinking about, you know, 80 years ago, what their mindset was. We're like, well, this is clearly uh, they were creating a character to, that could go out there and beat on the, the less privileged because we were entering the Depression. And, you know, this is what they wanted it to do to people struggling. It's like, you know, it could just be that they wanted to create a superhero and they thought Batman sounded good. That's and right. they put a uniform on him that kind of looked neat. And then they created a backstory. They, well, he's got a lot of stuff. Maybe he should be a millionaire, so that would explain why he can afford it. <laughs> like they, well, everything these, is overthought these days. These idiots don't understand 
you know, differences in thought in people that live in their generation. So the idea that they're going to go back and they're going to look at previous generations and understand what they thought, what their experience was. You know, we hear all this stuff about like, oh, my lived experience. You need to take into account all these people's yeah. lived experience. But that what never goes the other way, does it? Aaron? That's one I mean, of the they, biggest they problems that... we face today they, uh, they is that, that uh, solipsistic people with no knowledge of history before they were born make snap judgments, which are not thoughtful or reasoned but are based, uh, uh, the purpose of the snap judgment is to announce, look at me, I it's, am such a good person, I it, care, I it, care so very much. And it's all based on lies. In fairness, we have a generation of people that, as you said, doesn't understand anything that happened before they were born. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, when we're seeing articles about, hey, you know what would be brilliant to, mm -hmm. for climate change? Let's put sails on boats. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, when fucking boats. retard, you just you just created fucking sailboats. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's an old gag. Boat what technology did, what did socialists, a thousand years. What did socialists use for light uh, before fire? Electricity. Yes. Oh, <laughs> snap. <laughs> Well, yeah, we're talking boy. about lived experiences. These people don't have like the experiences. They 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 live vicariously through the screen, and they call that a lived experience. You know, then that's mm. why guys like you know the stands and the Kirby's of the world. They were veterans. They were people who went out in the world and lived full lives, and that's why they were able to write stories that were directly based on actual heroism because they actually understand what a hero is and what a villain is. These writers, they. They don't call it villains because to them there's no such thing as villains. There's just mm -hmm. misunderstood Unless people, even though, even though Darth Vader blew up an entire planet. But that's misunderstood, though. That's misunderstood, though. It was Tarkin, uh, not Vader. Yeah, it wasn't Vader. It was Tarkin. <laughs> well, there's another problem with comics in that it's it's a, such a simple appearing. Life yes. Or, it appears so simple. Words and pictures. Everybody thinks they can do a comic, and everybody does. But Sturgeon's law holds true. Mm. Theodore Sturgeon, a great science fiction writer, mm -hmm. and his law was 90% of everything is crap. And that's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, some kind of supreme lack of imagination that we're being corralled into believing or having to believe that you can only have heroes that look exactly like you. When in fact that 40 years ago when I'm reading X-Men, my hero was a black woman with a mohawk. Who, who's the leader of the team and uh, i mean like storm is my favorite all-time x-men and th there's no replacing that emotional connection like she had crippling claustrophobia and i had crippling asthma i had i felt like storm when she was having one of her one of her attacks i mean that was like really like you know a, a connective tissue there and you know but are you telling me an it, asthmatic became a comic book nerd Yes. Indeed. Wow. <laughs> never, <laughs> never in all of human <laughs> history. Yeah, that so <laughs> and here too is like they're, they're the modern writers are missing the point uh, with the intersecting uh, human uh, the the real world's needs into our comic book lands. These are this is why they're fiction. You can a, you can have absolute good and you can have absolute bad, and they fight it out in this imaginary place because the real world is where all the grays happen, and you're taking away our escapism by intersecting the, these needy real world activists things into our floppies, you know, it's no escapism, and no escapism. So, so we did get some screenshots, Mike. We, Ooh. we've long suspected that we're going to be getting Punisher within daredevil born again. Obviously Punisher was in the Netflix show uh, written by Christos Gage and his wife, at least the first uh, season, which was really, really good. And they've got the screenshots that show the police are going out there with the Punisher logo on their own stuff, harking back to like a 2017 story arc from Becky Cluden, where the Punisher lets the police know, you know, you shouldn't support me, you should support Captain America. Which I understand why they did it. Obviously, it bothers, you know, so the writers and the editors, and probably just Marvel as a corporation or a corporate entity of Disney at this point, that um, some people within law enforcement and the the um, profession of arms, you know, military, like the Punisher logo, and they want to call them out there. But it always, it just feels wrong with the character, Mike, because 
I don't think Punisher is socially conscious. I don't think that he cares about stuff like that. He's really only there for justice and, and to go out there and, and complete the mission. He's always on mission. He doesn't have time to worry about whether or not the police like his logo and, and appreciate what he's doing. Now, if the police went out there in a Punisher outfit and were acting like they were him and killing people in Punisher's name and it not being him, then I think he would go back and kill him. But I don't think he's socially aware, but the editors are, so he has to be as well. It's just weird. I am proud and happy when police and military adopt the Punisher logo because it stands for justice. Chris Kyle, uh, American sniper, wore a Punisher hat. When I was in Afghanistan, you know, uh, my little unit, we made a coin, and guess what? It had a Punisher logo on it. <laughs> and when the, the Army unit that we worked with, I think one of their, their parts, uh, detachment, had a Punisher logo on it. When we were going back to America and we were talking to all the people that we'd been working with for the last year, you know, taking down insurgents and stuff, a lot of their stuff had Punisher logos on it. It's, it's, it's a cool logo that it resonates with people, and I don't understand why it drives them insane. Yeah, well, I do. Well, I mean, all these young men and women, <laughs> a lot of these people that, well. skin that are downrange in Afghanistan. I wasn't in Iraq, but, you know, most of them are in between the ages of like 18 and 24. Like, these are little kids that you've sent off to war. And why do you care about what the fucking logo is? How about how much harm you put in, how much harm's way you've actually put a bit? You know, it wasn't fun. Well, these people don't care about soldiers. They don't care about the police. They don't care about people that put their lives on the line. You know, everything is everything is fascism to them. They don't even know what that means, but they like to scream it at everything that uh, that they don't understand. So, I mean, you're dealing with a generation, uh, and, and it's designed this way. George Carlin was saying this in the '80s in his stand-up. Uh, the powers that be, you know, the Department of Education, the people that lord over uh, these government systems, they have no vested interest in a populace that is filled with critical thinkers and people that can uh, logic that have logic and reason. Uh, that does not benefit them. So what you have instead is you have them pumping out these little Marxist autonom uh, automatons. Yes, thank you. <laughs> from uh, I knew I'd get there. Uh, from uh, you know, from these academic uh, institutions, and they have no conception of the real world. They have no conception of history. All they know is what their gender studies professor has opened their little head and poured into their brains, and they never question it because they've never been taught how to, and that's by design. Of course it is. I mean, mm. look, you. the Punisher would not give a shit who uses his, his logo unless they're starting to kill innocent people. Mm. Um, you know, that's the point. The point is a, you know, we have a system. Yeah, I, I, and I'm fine with us having a, you know, a justice system with checks and balances and all that stuff. I think that's good. But periodically, there needs to be things that operate outside of that system, and that's what the 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 um, that's the point of of the Punisher. He's the thing that operates outside the system when the system doesn't fails. Work. Yeah, when it fails, and even in past issues, if you look back, like actually read some issues, like there was one issue where he was stuck on the on like a bus and now stranded in snow. I can't remember who I think. Not he wrote, but he was stranded in snow with a bunch of ours, and he was talking about cops, and he was just saying, "Hey, you know, they they just do their job." When no, they he didn't write them off, and that was in the early '90s. So I'm like, "Where's this weird revisionist history come from?" That he's always hated him. No, he's always been pretty moderate. It's just, hey, you know, if you're a good one, it's all good. If you're not a good one, well, then yeah, we have to you know take that personally. So I don't get where the it's not. Oh, it was all like this. Well, outright ignoring history that has happened that contradicts that. That would require them knowing that history first. Oh, well, I mean to, to accept that it happened because nothing outside their boring experience ever happened. Yes. Anyways, we got a comic to share. Let's talk about it. Uh -oh, Mike, your muted. your mic's off. Mike, your mic. Uh, I created, uh, my dogs were barking, I created oh. Proud American <laughs> to show what the Punisher should be doing today. And uh, mm -hmm. when we meet him, he's on the southern border where a mm -hmm. human trafficker is about to rape a 12-year-old girl. Uh, mm -hmm. And the Punisher grabs him by the chin, pulls him back and slits his throat. And, and that's where we meet him. And uh, uh, my protagonist, uh, Marco Zamora, 
is a second generation Cuban American who served in Afghanistan and lives in Texas. And he can no longer stand by watching the destruction of the country as uh, human traffickers, drug, drug smugglers and terrorists pour across the southern border unchecked. So in the tradition of all great American vigilantes, he starts to do something about it. And when people found out that I had created a Punisher character uh, that was on the southern border, uh, as you can imagine, the reaction was outrageous. They were talking, me, calling me racist, everything under the sun, racist, 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 which brings me to the rule of the left. And this is the rule they live by. Whatever lie serves the vicious child at that moment. And that's the sum total of their philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, but as always happens, when we're attacked for one of these things, uh, a lot of people rally to our defense because uh, they say, well, this isn't fair. I, we're sick of these American assholes uh, trying to drown everybody else out. And you have to remember, it is a minority. They, they uh, give the appearance of a majority. They give the appearance of being much more powerful than they are uh, because they, 50 years ago, and this is all by plan, they took over education, the arts, media, and politics, understanding that they would be able to control the narrative. Uh, and now they, they're very successful with it. Yeah, just look at the government we have now. But for the left, there are only two things that matter, the narrative and the agenda, and that's it. And we all know what the narrative is, white, bad, any other race, good, man, bad, any other sex, good, America, bad, any other country, good. That's the narrative. We all know it by heart. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? And then and, and, and because they have it, and they have the default perception because they have mm -hmm. all these facets of our life, like by default, people mm -hmm. lean towards that slant first because they have every aspect of our lives controlled in that regard. It's absolutely nuts. It's a, it's a real life monopoly on, on our lives, basically. Well, uh, people are catching on. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, yes, there are. Yeah, and there you are. know they're divesting themselves of this DEI bullshit for starters. Mm -hmm. uh, as long and, as they don't replace it with another name, and, remember we have and, to stay vigilant. Well, they're gonna they do that. I mean, they will camouflage it, and it transmits, and and it's always to save the earth, to save the environment, mm -hmm. to save the whales, whatever it is, and and the result is always the exact opposite of what they say. There's an old Arab proverb. He strikes mm -hmm. me cries out and raises me to complain. And that too is the left in a nutshell. I gotta let my dogs out, guys. I'll be right back. Well, the the idea behind um, Private American, it, it kind of reminds me um, similarly mm -hmm. to, remember remember what they did during the Sam, whenever they first made Sam Wilson Captain America? What was yeah. that entire first story arc? The entire first story arc was about how border patrol was bad and people people going down there and deciding, you know what? The, the government's not doing its job. I'm going to do it instead. Mm -hmm. That was somehow evil. Well, of course it's evil because, once again, it's because people who they don't like socially or politically, they have to think, well, if they like it, then we have to automatically deem it. As you no, know, it actually makes a lot of sense. Um for in my, to Mike's credit, I haven't read it yet, and I now that I know about it more, I plan to. But private America actually does make a lot of sense that you had a Cuban American because a lot of those people lived under a very obvious dictatorship. And also, if you talk to a lot of them in like Florida per se, they you know they are a lot of them are very pro America. I mean, one of the biggest uh, top name UFC fighters is a Cuban American. He's as pro America as it gets. Uh, Jorge Masvidal. Those you, they, they, they understand that they understand immigrants who are yeah, they, who have become American citizens, and they're all warning us about what's going on. All these people they know. Who came here from China and Russia mm -hmm. and Venezuela legally to escape the mm -hmm. horror of uh, totalitarianism. Are saying, people, this is what we ran from. Once you destroy the United States, there's no place left to go. Yeah. No, it, I, I, that, I'm just saying that that's a really good fit that you went for Cuban American because a lot of Cubans did have that experience. They were they're going to be one of the first to know firsthand. So that that's a very good way of going about it. 
But no, it's I'm I'm glad to see that. Yeah, you're at a good point in your career now where you're that much more productive with. So I'm assuming you're going to do a follow up to Private America. Oh yeah, yeah, it's already in the works, but it's a long ways off because next we're doing Nexus Scorch, and then we're doing the Nexus Origin, which will be recolored by Kelsey, and then we're either doing Nexus Triplets, which Kelsey is also illustrating, or Uh Sherlock Holmes versus Captain Nemo which is completely finished and ready to go to the printer. It was illustrated by Richard Bonk, and it seems like Richard had been waiting all his life to draw steampunk. The Mm -hmm. art is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I will show you a soup song of it. Yeah, no, as soon as Wes is back, we'll be able to share a screen, but no, that's good. So you're clearly now show work between your creator own work, license work you're doing between the Sherlock Holmes stuff, Mm -hmm. including at Ripiverse. I mean, that's got to be nice to say that you've been at it this long in your career and you're probably, it sounds like you're probably even busier than ever. That's got to be a good problem to have. It is. It's a fun <laughs> That's good. So, I mean, I, I know it's fresh still, especially on, on my mind, but I, I take it then Florida Man 3 is probably a ways off, like a year or two off then. When oh, that at happens. least, at least. We just okay. did Florida Man. Yeah. We're very really happy with it. I'm really happy at how it turned out. It was a really funny book. It was like, Straight up, like laughing out loud, fun, even with rereads. And the fact that Gary Duba is this fun character, you have a great supporting character in Crystal. And Crystal, the fact that she has her, her wrestling name too is hilarious. Um, I, I laugh at the names. I was just yeah, like, I know. Man, Thank you. Great. And that's just the key. I mean, very few comics are actually funny, but uh, Florida Man will make you laugh out loud, guaranteed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, no, I, no I, I, I'm looking forward to when it happened. But either way, I'm going to check out your stuff as a good holdover. Now, I wonder, I really, um, how much does Marvel Disney um, get from license, licensing that iconic Punisher logo that we're all talking about? That that's so problematic because it's been. Well, I don't think they license people. it at all. Maybe the T-shirt manufacturers, but yeah, and but I, you know, Disney is woke as hell. They're probably embarrassed by it too. So let's pull oh. all Punisher merchandise. We don't want the people to have bad thoughts. Well, mm-hmm. if, if they're, they're there's a reason why they're embarrassed by it because the people that they are socially politically against like it, and because they like it, they had to automatically against it because they people who are not like them. They had to find a way to dehumanize them in That's every right. aspect, break exactly. them down. All right. I think he wants to share a comic, Wes. Welcome back. This is another comic? Another, another comic. Hey, There's another one. He is our Ooh. guest. And another I mean, one. No, no, no I, I got it. I didn't realize it was there. I got to save it. And then it's I've okay. got to put it onto the thing to make it a webpage. Well, and big in it. And yeah, then, that's uh, a page from Richard Bonk's uh, Sherlock Holmes story uh, in Captain Nemo, and they're both visible in the bottom panel. I've loaded it, and then I'll uh, open the thing, then I'll pull it out, and then I will go Ooh. to the... Wait, just wanted uh, to say something. Crazy. Um, I'm at Amazon right now, and there are 317 different products that have the official Marvel logo as a merchandising thing. So Marvel is still making mint off of this problematic, troublesome Punisher logo. And they make a lot of money off of this thing. This is what you wanted, Mike? Yeah. Ooh. All right. Is this, uh, this looks Sherlock Holmes versus Captain Nemo. And this, this one, I'm very proud of this one. Uh, you're people are gonna love it, you know. I it just clicks and pops on every page, and it's true the, to the Holmes uh, 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 legend. Uh, I'm a big Sherlock Holmes fan. You know, the funny thing about Holmes is probably the most widely recognized fictional character in history, and that long after Edgar uh, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle's death, uh, there are 10 times as many Sherlock Holmes stories as there were before. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but Kareem Abdul-Jabbar has written two graphic novels featuring Mycroft Holmes, Sherlock's brainier older brother. Very nice. I'm also a big Sherlock Holmes fan. But I don't think people get like the actual character because if you watch like Sherlock on BBC or you watch like Sherlock Holmes, mm-hmm. like the movie with Robert Downey Jr., ah. 
That's not really that's not really Sherlock Holmes. No, it's it's not. But Jeremy Brett was Sherlock Holmes. That was yeah. BBC. And I also thought uh, Benedict Cumberbatch as Holmes was brilliant. It's it's very very good. But like, if you actually read the stuff, he's not like socially awkward. He is like a little bit self centered, yeah, and right. he is obsessed with his work. But he gets along with everybody. That's why he's got contacts throughout the entire city of London. Well, he also refers to himself as a high functioning sociopath. <laughs> That's actually a pretty apt description of the character. I love Sherlock Holmes. He's great. I like the um, the the audible thing that they did uh, with uh, Fry, where he does all the narration for it. Fantastic stuff. Man. Comics. Don't you just love them? Well, I love comic books. I love comics. <laughs> I love them. I believe there's a graphic novel with uh, Sherlock Holmes fighting... Dracula for the love of uh, of Mary Riley. Wow. Or maybe he was fighting maybe it was Jack the Ripper fighting Dracula. It was one or the other. Well, when you read this Holmes version, when, when you read the book that I wrote, uh, uh, there will come a, 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 a guest appearance by a famous literary character that will blow your mind. Guaranteed. Very nice. That's all so I Mike... Can. Obviously, uh, you did a lot of awesome work on Punisher. You did great work on Flash. You did great work on lots of characters in Marvel DC. You did great work on your own characters and stuff like that. And you seem to have gotten better with age. Do you feel like you're in a better place now? Would you ever want to go back and, and work on the Punisher again? Would they even allow it? I guess is the oh, no, no, of course, it's out of the question. And that's why I created Private American. I can do whatever I want with Private American. Uh, and I will. It'll be true to the Punisher roots. Uh, and uh, 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 there's a lot of humor in it. In everything I write, there's a touch of humor. Even the bleakest tragedy has a flash of humor. Uh, Shakespeare understood that. And if you read uh, uh, Romeo or Ju and Juliet or Macbeth or any of those tragedies, he throws the jokes in at the oddest times. Yeah, it cuts the tension. <laughs> I have a really odd question. I've noticed, especially with a lot of your, your creator-owned stuff, I notice your characters like to sing a lot. Do you like listen to music while you're working? Because like, oh, I'm like I never, there has to be never a pattern. listen to music while I'm working. Okay, I because I notice your characters sing a lot. Your characters sing a lot. I I do love music and I listen to it all the time. I we go mm -hmm. out during summer, <clears throat> Ann and I, night mm -hmm. after night to hear the bands in town. There are so many bands in this town. It's just crazy. And I've been doing that all my life. I told you about the records, right? How I, yeah. I started writing. Yeah, and I'm still doing it. No, so you're I, in Colorado? I, yes. Colorado you got Springs? got a good scene over there in Colorado. Fort That's Collins. a great scene up there. Fort Collins, so you're north of Denver. Yes. Very nice. So I was in Colorado Springs for quite some time, and my roommate down there went to, to Colorado State. And after I went to Omaha on my next assignment, I came back, and he was a student there, and uh, it was a good time. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. A lot of fun to be had in Fort Collins. And I imagine there is a lot of live music because it's a college town. It's crazy. I don't know how much uh, the music has to do with college towns. I think colleges attack, attract musicians. Mm -hmm. When I was attending the University of Wisconsin, I saw Paul Butterfield, uh, Muddy Waters, uh, Miles Davis, oh, wow. Jimi Hendrix. Murderers roll of talent. Jeez, man. Nice. Woo! So do you okay. partake in all the micro brews? Because I remember there being a lot of uh, breweries there as well. I used to. I, I don't drink much anymore because it keeps me awake. But I do love to drink. I love beer. Uh, every now and then I'll have one. The earlier in the day, the better. You know, I can get back up and start drinking at 10 a.m. That'll take care of the problem. <laughs> but I, I don't. I mean, I, I've certainly drunk my fair share of alcohol over the years. And I do love the micro brews. Uh, and many of the places where we see these bands are microbreweries. Mm -hmm. uh, and the best is Odell's at the north end of town. They have a beautiful brewery and an incredible patio. It is so beautiful in, uh, in summer with the hanging ferns. And they have a, uh, a stage and, and they have bands on Wednesdays and Sundays. And we go out there all the time. That's it. A spinoff of the aficionados, the microbrewery aficionados. Here you go, Wes. On top of fast food aficionados, we now it's need the microbrewery kind of a aficionados. Big thing here. When I was in, <laughs> in Fort Collins, I went to the New Belgium Brewery, and we they did a little tour there. Yeah. And they were talking about how they were like self-sustaining, like all the 
the byproducts of the brewing process they used to turn into energy. They had solar. I think they had wind power, all this kind of stuff. So they were completely off the grid. And uh, a lot of hippies in Colorado. And, oh, yeah. and me, I'm an antagonist. So I was sitting down there and we get a little thing with the eight different you new know, Belgian breweries. Uh, beers that they offer, obviously the biggest one is Fat Tire, I believe, and we're drinking them in, in my New Belgium. My yeah. buddy, yeah, New Belgium Brewery. And my buddy was sitting there with uh, his college friends. I was, I was like, yeah, I could never support New Belgium Brewery again. I was like, why not? I was like, off the grid. I was like, I support big electricity. You know what I mean? <laughs> 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 I was like, I can't support stuff like that. They, you know, they should be helping people out and paying their dues. And apparently, the the table behind me. We're about Lost to have a hard shit. because they didn't realize that I'm just a middle child that was in the military, so I'm an antagonist a little bit. But it was a good time. So I have my tire. I have a question. <laughs> um, this a question for Mike. Now I probably already know the answer to this, but I figure I'd you know ask. You know, Marvel recently has been doing a lot of the you know they haven't had a lot of success with their modern comics. Um, they've you know, they just did that Punisher reboot that was basically Frank Castle. Everything about Frank Castle except for Frank Castle. Um, they've been, but they've been revisiting older stories with comics set in the past. There's no chance that they've reached out at all to go do a Punisher story that was set in, say, the 90s or the 80s. Or would there be? No. <laughs> I, I figured as much, but you know, it's always worth the ask. Uh, uh, New Belgium sponsors a bicycle parade every year called the Tour de Fat, which has to be seen to be believed. It's just so funny. People show up on their homemade bikes in costume. It just goes on and on. That sounds like a whole Also, if you party. work at New Belgium Brewery for 12 months straight, they give you a bike as like a company gift. Well, what? Yeah, they, they have their own bikes. They're very nice. Yeah. And I'm an avid biker. So, Mike, what did you do to, to Marvel Comics? Did you tell them to lose your number, or did you just finally oh, yeah, of course uh, eventually not. over time? Of course they, they not. Just decided editors, to forget about editors change. Editors come and editors go. And this new breed of editors, as far as I know, going back at least 10 years, is they're not interested in entertainment. They're interested in their agenda. As I mentioned before, there's the narrative and the agenda. And this is social justice warriors. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a form of narcissism because it's all about preening in front of others about how, what, a, what a wonderful, giving, loving person you are as, as you're banning everybody right and left. Uh, but the editors uh, are not interested in entertainment. They're interested in their agenda. And so they hire writers who have no idea how to entertain who are interested in pushing their agenda. And that's what you get, agenda-driven comics. And they're circling the drain. Uh, and uh, each book sells less than the last. And they keep shoving these characters down our throat, like Kamala Khan, the uh, Muslim superheroine. Mm -hmm. uh, she fails, she fails, she fails. And they just keep rebooting her and rebooting her and say, yeah, we're going to stop. And we're not going to stop until you, you buy the agenda. And it's not going to work. But she's a mutant now, so she's an X-Man, so that means that you should buy her now. That that that'll that'll legitimize her. No, you're you're hitting on something you're hitting on something great, Mike, because these <clears throat> things have been going on long enough that I think a lot a lot of people need to accept that there's a likeliness a lot of these characters, especially under these regimes, are not going to change. And that's why seeking out like ultras like what well, stuff you're writing, or even just someone else that doesn't matter who is is very important because you now if unless you're you know reading it to laugh at it, but a lot of it you can't really bank on it changing because well, don't we all read for entertainment and, and and that's why we're not picking up these corporate comics. And there's some question that's been around for years whether they're gonna continue to publish physical books at all. Uh because right now the only purpose these books serve is as springboards for movies and unfortunately the movies seem to be actually based on the books recently oh man yeah the, the they movies are. are woke and and nobody goes to see them i mean mike you have so much perspective when it comes to this especially with like the publication industry itself like okay last month i got a, a copy of sports illustrated and what used to be a weekly one of the most popular magazines on the planet with men okay and their ads are still directed at men too 
but it's $8.99 a copy now, and it's a monthly. And, and check this out. The subscription, if you get a mail subscription for one year, it's $20. That's a buck sixty-six an issue. I mean, are they even thinking about making money using the print? You know, well, buck sixty six isn't isn't bad, but I lament the lack of print culture. And I think it's one of the worst things about the internet is the disappearance of periodicals and magazines that I used to love, like motorcycle mm -hmm. magazines. There used to be four monthly motorcycle magazines and and now there are none. There are a couple from Britain that they, they mm -hmm. sell over here. But the only motorcycle magazines produced in the United States are those devoted to classic bikes or, or uh, little fringe groups that will support it. And, I, of course, I think the, the cycle industry uh, itself is in danger now uh, because we have a whole generation of, of young people that are adverse to any kind of risk. So you're more of a crotch rocket guy? Well, uh, at some point, I would say this. At some point, a gentleman must trade in his crotch rocket for a cruiser. And so uh, <laughs> I ride a cruiser. Oh, <laughs> but you used to have like a ninja or something. Uh, I had a Kawasaki GPZ 550, uh, which was a precursor to uh, the ninja. And it was a great bike. I loved it. I also had a Hawk GT. I wish I'd never sold that. That's a a light little bike with a V-twin engine, 650 engine, and it was just wonderful. I bet but you now I, hated I that. have a, a Shadow 750, and I've been I got it in 20 in 1998, and I've been riding it ever since. The wife was okay with you having a motorcycle that fast before? Uh, well, she. This was by the time I met Anne, I had had that uh, the Shadow Cruiser for, ah, okay. many, for many years. So that's much more acceptable. No, not to her. <laughs> no, she doesn't even like that. <laughs> My wife tries to make me very risk averse. I've explained it to her. It's okay to be in a little bit of danger. And she does not believe so. She's no, because like, she doesn't want to. She doesn't want to have to. She doesn't want to have to change your colostomy bag when you have that motorcycle accident. I've already know, told her that. it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> I, I told her I was like, don't. Don't think you're done with diapers after this baby's done. Like, I'm only a few years down the road. <laughs> yeah. Risk Good averseness. Stuff. It's a fun, it's a so fun my, line. As somebody that's done a lot of work on these characters, and, and um, Sully here was talking about how he really loves your work on Wally West Flash and all that kind of stuff. You know, when I was reading Heroes in Crisis, and it was clear that Wally West was going to be a major character in that one, and then basically the, the big reveal was that he was the serial killer that basically killed all the other heroes in Sanctuary. And, and that stuff bothers me. You know, it, it, I, I get a little emotional in my response. I got to talk about it. As somebody that put in a lot of hard work and hours and, you know, has sweat equity in the character of Wally West. Now, obviously, it's owned by DC and not you, but do you take that stuff personally? No. In fact, I, I was unaware of it until this minute. You didn't what? realize what happened in Heroes in Crisis? Yeah. Wow. You're so lucky. Oh, you are so lucky. <laughs> I, oh, I, wish I, I wish I was Mike right now. Don't only oh, stop God. buying comic books for five years because of it. I, well, I very oh. rarely read modern comics. Uh, uh, most of the comics I read are comics that my friends send me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not a bad thing. Sully, you, did, you were... You were traumatized. God, well, I won't give it that much credit, but I was extremely PO'd. I was so you stopped buying comic books cold for four yeah. years. I mean, I missed out on uh, a death metal. I missed out on Infinite Frontier. You know, shit, I, stuff I would have really been into because I love that kind of those crisis level stories. You know, and um, but I needed a break from it. And but I've I've been following comics all my life. You know, you take breaks here and there. That's how you, you start to miss it after a while, and it fosters some love. And if they're good, the back issues are always new if you haven't read them yet. Well, there seem... are good comics out there, but remember Sturge's hmm. Law. You have to uh, seek them out. Yeah, this is something I've I've noticed a lot of people are still trying to get used to. And, you know, I've grown up very obviously, I know, because of my parents of Metalhead. And being a metalhead, especially as far as like the underground bands, like the Accepts of the world, the Saxons of the world, like those are bands a lot of people have to seek out. They weren't just put in front of them. So I was kind of already molded into that mentality. So transferring that to comics for me is a bit seamless. Whereas mm -hmm. for a lot of people for comics, it seems like they're, they're, it's it's a new thing for them. Like, oh man, you know, they've had years of being into like the Flash 
or Spider-Man. And it's like transitioning takes a little extra because they're so used to it. For me, it's a seamless transition because I was already used to that. But yeah, definitely getting comics fans to have conversions hard because, you know, and to be fair, I, I get to point, especially when there's an emotional attachment, we're all creatures of habit to a point. It does make it hard to let go when there is that emotional attachment. But for me, though, I grew up a metalhead and seeking things out was like, that was like the default thing. Like you would go through thanks list. We look like the liner notes and they see who they think. Of, who's this name? Check that out. Who's that? Check that out. Check that out. So for, for comics, I was like, oh, yeah, this is easy. Okay, I've already got this in the bag. That's why, you know, when I first saw this whole scene, you were the first book I ever saw it out with the, the first Florida Man back in, I think it was 2020 when it was currently on a campaign run, 2020. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, and I was like, oh, hey, all right. I like how this sounds. And that was perfect, Cohen's title, because I was looking at Florida Man on Google every day to see what was the birthday of that day. I don't. I think the the thing with Sturgeon's Law, I don't know if that really even applies to comics anymore. I think it's uh, more like 99% is crap, especially when they're publishing 600 books a month. Well, the, what I've learned, Mike, and this has been a hard lesson because when you read a character and, you know, writers used to have really long runs. They would do years and you would have a few artist changes on there or whatever. But, you know, you kind of fall in love with old Dick Grayson and you, you feel like he's a friend at some point. And you really enjoy his adventure. And, and you know, maybe there's another writer comes on. He's got a different spin, but it, it's ge generally speaking pretty good. But today the writers are bouncing around so fast. I've learned not to emotionally invest in characters anymore. To just fo follow the writers around to the characters that they're working on at that moment. And it does uh, make me happier knowing that don't expect Wally West to be done well until he's done well. And then you can be happy about it. Mm -hmm. So, I, uh, guys, I might add that anybody's interested in my books, I have a website. It's barrencomics.com. Barrencomics.com. And if you go there, you'll find everything that we have crowdfunded in the last couple of years, starting with the first Florida Man. By we, I mean Chris Brawley, who runs my campaigns and is the force behind Bleeding Fool, uh, and the wonderful artists with whom I've been lucky enough to work. Absolutely. Let's, let's bring that up. I actually had it up earlier, but then I didn't think we were going to do it, but I've got that mm -hmm. bad boy. I like that. Bob, I like the Bob's coming into the stream too. Bob's sticking his head up into the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Dog. So we got Mike If you want to go check out a Florida man or, or get in line for Nexus scourge or be in there for, are we ever getting badger again, Baron? Or is he on the yes. back? Burn? Yes. <clears throat> nice. Uh, as, as long Wallace, as Nexus is, people seem to, to still to like Badger even more these days. Well, I, I do have a big graphic novel in the works, and I'm very proud of it, but it won't be out for at least a year. Uh, and Nick, I want to thank you for uh, favoring Hogzilla and talking about it the way you did. Uh, and that's oh, exactly the reaction I was you. hoping to achieve. No, you absolutely nailed it with that type of comic, especially it's one thing, you know, when people talk about seeking out alternatives. But it's also committing to promoting those alternatives because people keep talking about, you know, the bad stuff. And, you know, and that's fine. I, I think there's a place for both sides of the conversation. But if you keep saying that, you know, you want alternatives, but you're not doing anything to actually talk about those alternatives, especially the ones that you're invested in, well, then you're really no better than the people on the other side. And I, I made it a priority, especially for a book like Florida Man and Florida Man versus Hogsdale. I really feel genuine love for Gary Duba. I feel the humor. I love the ridiculousness of it all. As I said, it's you no know, Florida man is smile tap. You just crank it to 11 and you have a fun, good time with it. Don't think too hard about it. Just roll with it. Well, well that's how a reputation spreads and, and how my book sell is through word of mouth, which is the mm -hmm. most powerful advertising tool of all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, fellas, you're going to have to keep talking because I'm having some all right. Hey, oh, well, we, no, we can kill. Oh, well, that's, we can no, that's no, usually not a problem. Like, usually, uh, usually you got to stop us. Yeah, I like to tell you your way to say some watermelon no. cantaloupe, watermelon cantaloupe, <laughs> what, like an no, actor says but, in the background. <laughs> promoting these books it, it, it's a fun thing i love doing it i'm a i'm a comics fan i i, I did for you i mm -hmm. did for gabe's dean kane all-american lawman which i really enjoyed as well gabe and I, is when, one of my oldest friends in comics oh is he really hey, that's cool no dude he, his, he killed it with that book man he really killed it and it's it's nice you know see you guys make these books that are really good they're filled with great characters very likable characters and they're very fun and they have heart to them too as well 
It's even Gary Duba, and then no one would think it because of floor man. But there is a there is a there is a there is a sliver of heart if you, you know pay attention through the cracks. There there is there is a, a core of his personality there, and obviously you could say the same about well, Gabe's the, book. the key to to his appeal is that he's not just a, a crazy meth freak that. Gary has a heart of gold and he'll give you the shirt off his back. Yes. And yes. That is the, the story's depth and humanity. And that's how we connect to those characters. It's like, yeah, okay. I don't have the live, the life experience, you know, of a, like a snake coming up from my toilet, but I, I do relate to his humanity. I may not look like him, but I relate to his humanity because at the end of the day, a lot of us, I do feel are good in nature. And we want to be able to help people even as crazy as we can be sometimes. And Gary, as crazy as can be, yeah, he does care about the people in his circle at the end of the day. I mean, we all can't relate to James Bond, but man, when we watch those classic movies, we see the cars, the gadgets, the ladies, all the high style, high style, profile, Ric Flair style. We envision us as, as James Bond. James Bond don't become us. We become Bond in that moment. That's a beautiful feeling. Yeah, you'd be interested to know that they've tapped Lizzo to play the new James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> very, very correct. Hey, Wraith wants to know about a Nexus movie or animated series. Uh, Wraith, they, Hollywood has been sniffing around that property for years. They should either shit or get off the pot. Uh, mm -hmm. It'll become real when I get a check. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Let's hear for the people. Lade Kramer, wow, you skip me, Wes. Payback for the jackpot, I guess. I did not skip you. You've got a name. It's shenanigans. I haven't figured out where you're from, but that'll be next week. Callum says it's all next, referring to Venom eating uh, Paul. I added Doc so he can go check it out if you would like. Uh, Calvin says, Mr. Barron, can you talk about your your Hawk and Dove 97? What was the experience? What were, what were fan reactions since there's, they're different from the old ones? Did it do well? He said, did it well. Oh, yeah. Did, wow. did it do well? No, did it well. It did well. Uh, and uh, I was very happy with that series because Hawk and Dove practically writes itself. You have the two sides of the political spectrum, and and they they bicker as they fight crime. <laughs> it's like the old uh, hard traveling heroes. Yeah, right, right. Uh, but again, uh, I uh, I prefer my own characters, uh, as I think that that most thoughtful writers do, and. I look forward to expanding these new characters that I've created, uh, notably <clears throat> Marco Zamora, who's the private American, uh, uh, Gary Duba, of course, and uh, Nexus, because this next Nexus book, Scourge, and, and I, I mentioned it before, but again, I have to tell you, it's ready to go to the printer. It's going to blow your mind. If just go to Indiegogo, and look at the Nexus Scourge page and sign up. You get a free art card by, by Kelsey if you sign up before we go live next week. Mm -hmm. uh, but just scroll down that page and look at Kelsey's art. Mm -hmm. I, I really do appreciate the fact that you have your stuff ready to go to print. I, I think that, you know, in the crowdfunding space, I, I can speak from my experience. I, I've gotten burned by so many crowdfunding projects where, yeah, you're sitting there a year two years later and nothing no yeah. rarely and, even any and then the person behind the project just kind of disappears off the well internet. they yeah they either disappear off the internet they go take a job somewhere and they're working for somebody else um there's all kinds of these 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 horror stories and i think that you know creators like yourself and i know like the guys over at iconic comics and there's a few other um, crowd funders that basically you guys are ready to go to print when you're soliciting your campaign, when you're, when you're soliciting the donations for the, for the backing. And that is, I think the thing that is going to keep the crowdfunding space working. You can't have too many people that kind of just drop the fucking ball and, right. and it still survives. Before I couldn't do it without my team. Uh, headed by Chris Brawley and a handful of terrific artists who have thrown in with us. I have a substack column, mikebaron.substack.com, and I recently did a column about Richard Bonk. And the head of the call, the title is Fast and Good. You can have it fast or you can have it good. Well, Richard is the exception to that rule. He's he fast and plays. good. It's nice when that happens. Every now and then you find a guy like that who could do 
something who could crank it out and be good. It's nice because they're they're not frequent. Like I remember once upon a time, I, I don't know how you feel about his preferences, but I know he has a base. Uh, Mark Bagley was a guy who was fast and he could crank out comics if they need to fulfill deadlines. I know Ramita Jr. back then used to crank out deadlines too, especially in his prime, and he he would get stacked on issues as well. It's yeah, those guys are, are a rare breed, but it's nice when you can get some. Well, what's even rarer is when an artist continues to improve throughout his life and is now producing the greatest work of his career. That's yeah, cool. anybody who has Roger seen this Cup. book, it's so good. Uh, has just been gobsmacked by the detail, the accuracy, and the emotion that Pat packs into every page. It's just unbelievable what he's done here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very nice. Garfield's Bizarre Adventure. The new Marvel writers and editors hate Punisher because they hate the audience that That's likes right. the Punisher, which leans conservative and libertarian. That's right. Also, I'm looking for Gooding, Mike. Good Is that how you pronounce it? Thank you, Gooding. Garfield. Uh, it's... Uh, I think it's about illustrated by now, and it's going to knock your socks off. Uh, I'm very proud of it, and I'm excited for it to come out. I think it'll be uh, it'll they're, they're going to start the crowdfunding either next month or the month after, uh, but it's ready to go to the printer too. And that's a story that'll grab you by the throat and drag you in to the exclusion of all else. Will Conrad's another great artist too. Oh, uh, he, he just you. you he did a few great issues on Venditti's Hawkman, some of my favorite stuff on that Hawkman run. And I remember thinking, wow, this guy's really good. I hope to see him more. And now that he's with you, that's a hand in glove fit. Wait till you see his work, and he's outdone himself. It's just oh, excellent. Very nice. And that's the one that's gonna be uh Rip Reverse? Yes. Very nice. How do you uh, how do you pronounce that? that? How do you pronounce that title, Mike? Gooding. Gooding, Gooding. the polymath. And uh, everybody said, oh, you can't call it the polymath. That's not a good title. But oh, why not? It's, but it's accurate. And the polymath is uh, a person who excels at many different disciplines. And that's good. I I help sense. Do you think that being broke or poor is cool now? Like Disney or that limp uh, D, Kevin Feige? Or do they think being broke or poor is cool now? Uh, I they think it's, uh, it's cool for other people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kevin, Kevin Kevin Feige ain't broke. <laughs> no, no. no. Uh, but, um, Disney no, look, I mean we broke. we live we live in a time where you have creators out there and uh, they've turned their Twitter into uh you know they're they're suddenly like foreign policy experts uh for the Middle East, but every Monday they have to put out a Ko-Fi asking for <laughs> you to donate so they can uh, they can buy groceries. But so, three I mean, years ago they were uh virologists and yeah. <laughs> last year <laughs> They were constitutional, constitutional scholars. scholars. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, look, if you if you can't manage your own life, I, I, I'm not coming to you for advice on anything, and certainly not geopolitics. Absolutely. Cobbett says, Mr. Barron, would you like to continue Green Lantern stories with uh, K221 and Martin? Our friend Doc uh, complained there are too many human lanterns. Well, uh, thank you, Common Sense. Doc uh, is right. I, again, no, I'm not interested in in other people's characters, with a handful of exceptions. Uh, I would prefer to write my own characters. Is there that are too many human lanterns, but Jeremy Adams did try to explain it recently. Mike, is is that something that's come up more recently? Um, that you, your, your preference for your own characters? Or is no, that something that's I, always I've been always there? felt that way. I've okay. always felt that way. I would prefer... To, can, if I'm going to do more books, I'm going to do the characters I created, notably Nexus, Badger, uh, Gary Duba, uh, Marco Zamora, uh, and the two police officers who appeared in Thin Blue Line. By the way, that's done. Uh, and we're going to, I don't know when we're going to start the campaign for that, but Thin Blue Line 2 is written, and I think it's even better than the first. And, and the, the title is The Revolving Door which should give you some insight into what it's about. <laughs> and, and I mentioned again that our penciler, Joe Arnold, was a full-time police officer. Oh, added life experience. Cool. Man, nice. Up, he says, uh, can you talk about the butcher since DC doesn't use him anymore? Or do they even have the rights to the character? Do you think he can work today? You know, I'm going to look into that, uh, Common, because uh, I think uh, he would make a, a great uh, guest appearance in Private American. 
Very nice. Uh, Sigma Kovacs, HH and the boys. Shout out to all. H -H. Mike Barron is a wonderful teacher, friend, and mentor. He's everything that's right about comics, the shining beacon of excellence in a time of reckless inadequacy. Support his Kickstarter today. Uh, you should check out Harold's comic. It's called Calico, and it's Punisher it for Animals. Go to Absolutely. Sigma He's got comics the manga right going up right now, wow. I believe. Yeah, I run into him all the time at cons, and I he, I love talking to HH German. He's got so much joie de vivre and spirit. He yes, he doesn't live it? comics. You know what I mean? This is us. We live comics. HH is just exemplified. HH that. has the jawline of a true hero. <laughs> I can't pull it off, but he's just naturally got it. Well, uh, you can do one of those things that you like uh, the Hollywood uh, the Hollywood guys use that you, you chew and it'll it'll give you that defined jawline. Very we nice. have a question I'll, here I'll, about I'll send you a link. Star. Uh, and the answer is that uh, Pat is already halfway through the first story in Bronze Star Ooh, number two, and it's nice. going to blow your mind again. He's just outdone himself. Uh, definitely, that might be, be a little literal for, too. Definitely be looking out for HH, the guys at Sigma Comics on the con trail. He's the hardest working guy out there and is always selling. Uh, here comes the Calico, and there are a lot of great mentors out there. I know we talked about Mike a lot. There are other couple of other guys out there that have really encouraged him. That stuff's always awesome. We got Drawing Tall. Do modern writers suck? Or have the new rules become so constrictive that they aren't allowed to do anything creative to make their writing good? Well, no. Uh, you have to judge each writer on his, her, or its own output, and that's what I do. If I read somebody and they suck, then they suck. If I read somebody and they're good, then they're good. Uh, but uh, to lump all modern writers together, uh, you can't do that. But they There's certainly also... do have constrictions that you didn't have in the 70s or 80s when they go to a place like a DC or Marvel and what they're even allowed to do with certain characters based on their physical traits and not even... Uh, who the character is or what they re represent. Well, it seems to me that, that uh, it's just the opposite, that they've thrown away the rules for all these characters and the new writer comes in and, and does something that's so completely out of character with what's gone before that nobody's interested. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll catch you too. I'm sorry, Aaron, you were saying something? Oh, yeah. I was just saying that, uh, you know, the other thing that you have to take into account with modern writers, and, and there are a lot that, you know, shouldn't be in the business because they they can't write. Uh, but a lot of the stories that you're getting are, uh, you know, they're not allowed to pitch anymore. They're hand an assignment that, you know, from a story idea that's come from the brain dead assistant editor pool. So, you know, they're handed crap and they're, you know, what, what's the saying? They're handed chicken shit and told to try to make chicken salad. So, you know, a lot of times, mm -hmm. you, you, you know, you just got to take a job. You can only say no so many times to bad ideas before you have to take something if you want to continue to get work. So, um, well, if you know, a lot of these court. writers, that's why you see when they get on something like uh, that they're really passionate about, then they can like knock it out of the park sometimes <laughs> if they have any chops. Blade mm -hmm. says the food and brews aficionados coming soon. I'd do Indeed. it. Indeed. Soup. But it is oh, difficult being in the Yeah. Yeah. Exactly have access well, to craft brews and. When you come to America next summer, we'll get that 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 one in a million episode going. It'll be great. <laughs> Common Sense wants to know Can you talk Sonic Disruptors? It would have been planned to be 12 issues, but ended in seven. Did readers not gravitate to the comic? And do you own the rights to that as well? Uh, I don't think they did, and, and uh, I blame myself for that. If it had been more compelling, I think we would have continued. But as I said, I'm not the same writer I was back then. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have uh, incorporated Sonic Disruptors into a new series I've written for uh, uh, David Martin Perkle, who lives in Austria, and it's called 2084, and it's about everything that's happening right now extrapolated into the future with one big difference and that is that powerful telepaths and telekinetics have emerged from the population mm -hmm. and they're forced to take sides either with the establishment which is trying to impose uh, fascistic rule on every living thing or with the rebels who are trying to overthrow them is that supposed to be a take on 1984 uh, I believe that he was referencing that because it was an inspiration uh, mm -hmm. for his book. That's probably still the best novel I've ever written, or at least the, the most impactful one. I mean, right. read the time I wrote you read, it, you read, read that it as one? an adult. I read. <laughs> but the second time I read it as an adult, after you know, because you had to read it in high school or whatever, mm -hmm. everything that was going on, I was like, holy crap. It's like I'm reading the fucking the news from 30 years from now. 
I, it doesn't, it doesn't exactly send you out of the room singing uh, and dancing. No. I picked up four issues of Sonic Disruptors at a con last year. I had them when I was in high school, a freshman in high school. I I, I was into it. And I got to tell you, Mike, that stuff it kind of oddly holds up. Uh, oh, it's, well, it's very you. it's very satirical and uh, and it's very cartoony as well. And I like the style. It's over the top and it's meant to be. But what I like the best, though, is because you have such a conservative bent, yet your hero, the Sheik, he is a bleeding heart liberal and you know how to write him just right. Well, that's like the, that. the shake is based on Frank Zappa. Yes, yes, exactly. And it's just, and it's brilliant. And um, I mean, seriously, I mean, uh, you know, thank you for, for that. I mean, I'm, thank you, Common Sense, for bringing up Sonic Disruptors, because that flies under everyone's radar. Wraith X7, I have no problems with Punisher logo being on military vehicles. I do have a problem with it being on police vehicles. I think that's a valid point. Um, yeah, yeah, the police vehicle belongs to the city. No, well, not Frank only was a veteran too. No, not only that, but you know, um, they are agents of the system. Like mm -hmm. they have to at least pretend to believe in upholding, even when the system doesn't work. Uh, they have to at least pretend. Guys, I'm gonna have to bow out. Okay. All right. Thank well, you so thank much. You, for, thank you. Mike, really appreciate it, brother. It was my pleasure, and I'd be happy to return. <laughs> well, we will definitely be happy to have you. Let me see. Do I still have this? I do have it. It is ready to go. And we've got Nexus Scourge. Right now, if you sign up at this very moment, Mike, people can get a, a free card from Kelsey Shannon. The The, the book goes live next week, or the, the project goes live next week. It's already done. And you're just waiting for the for the campaign to be over to print and, and send out. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Pleasure awesome. being on stream again, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. He's a legend. He's a legend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Wes. That's fun, man. You, you're able to get him on the show. That's Hell really yeah. Thank you for sharing him with us, man. Yeah, I definitely like to have a mic on there. Now, as far as the uh, the problem with the police vehicle, I can see I can see that one. Yeah, I mean, I, I can, I have a, you know, they, their 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 job is to be, ostensibly, the the job of the police and the job of the military are two very separate jobs. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want the military doing police actions, and you don't want police doing military action. Um, military turns out are terrible peacekeepers. Yes, exactly, and because they're looking at the folks that they're they're ostensibly supposed to be in charge of as potential threats and the police yes, the, the, all of our training doesn't go go out there to protect people in a city yes, it, it goes to out take to, out the bad guy exactly and that assumes a bad guy and it assumes everyone is a potential bad guy um whereas Definitely the not. police that's the, part of the training doc well, you have to identify the bad guy and make sure that you don't hit the people that aren't bad no no that's no I, that's training. that's that's my point though like you know you have to look at the entire population and then figure out who the bad guy is from there but you're kind of working backwards you don't mm -hmm. act until you know but mm -hmm. whereas the police they're they're designed to just uphold you know law and order that's that's it they're supposed to stop things whenever it goes really bad but i'm, I'm against them having the punisher i'm against police having the punisher logo on their uniform or on their vehicles in the same way that i'm uh, opposed to them having any uh kind of political statement uh, you know be it the trans flag or, or anything like that on their uh you know they they have to protect and, and serve the entire populace so you know they shouldn't have anything on their uniform on their vehicle that is divisive is the punisher way. logo a political right. statement though the, yeah, I well, just, I mean, they've, I they've made it, they've made it not statement. a political statement. Yeah, but inherently, it's but like not. don't even have, like, don't even have a Spider Man pin. I mean, come on, you're just you're that's not. Yeah, that's I can't that's tell not you not you're, you're not supposed to have like when you're in uniform. At least in the military, I believe it applies with police. Like if you're like the fraternal order or whatever, you're not supposed to put that pin on your uniform. If you're a member of the Republican Party, you're not supposed to put that on your uniform. If you go to like a a rally where you're a speaking member, you know, as a member of the police uh, police force or whatever, and you're speaking on behalf of the, the Republican Party or the Democrat Party, you're not allowed to be in the uniform because then people associate support, you know, with the city and kind of all that kind of stuff. So you are right. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that the Punisher logo is 
inherently uh, no but i'm just i'm saying like you shouldn't have any personal things on there just like you know and i feel that way like even about like disneyland you know it's like you know the disneyland employees should not be you know wearing their political slogans or, oh or even goodness. like their, you want to go to they, disneyland they and start imposing it I wanted hey, to go back up, to when, I wanted to go back to the outfit. way it was when Walt ran it. You didn't have anything that took you out of the immersion of Disneyland. You didn't have any kind of like BS modern, you know, like I, modern society stuff coming in. I you just, were there to enjoy the fantasy, man. I just want the the police and the military and everyone else to go back to not being a goddamn waiter at shenanigans. <laughs> <laughs> with with how much flair they have on their fucking jacket. Well, you're not, you're you don't have no flair on your that, That's not flair, Doc. That's those are medals. <laughs> <laughs> and the ones that you're talking about, you can only display them if you've actually done stuff. It's not like the longevity thing. You get a medal for that. When you get, you know, it goes on your uniform like as a little uh, little tick or whatever. But if it's, you got the medal, that means you're probably in war and you're in in arms way. So I don't have a problem with the military flair. When you've mm -hmm. uh, gone out there and earned that stuff. Hey, speaking to Disney real quick, Aaron Sparrow, I just picked up a copy of Song of the South, and it's still in print in Spain. Dude, oh, man, yeah. I want a copy of that. About 30 bucks that. on That's Amazon crazy. on Blu-ray, but yeah. Dude. <laughs> well, there's it's outlawed. I would have that out Exactly, and why is it outlawed? There's nothing wrong with that bloody movie. No, and, and it's uh, isn't isn't it uh, the first... Uh... The first black performer to win an Oscar, like wasn't that, I think that uh, was uh, Gone with the Wind, but it might have been the second. Yeah. Okay. I believe you're correct. I know. No, I know that there was a there was some milestone, some award milestone that came from that. Um, not exactly sure what it was, but maybe maybe uh, one of the experts in the chat can tell us. Rate the X seven. The difference between the left and the right is that the left lie to themselves and the right lie to other people. Yay. <laughs> uh, Were you talking about the, like I the say... political parties? You know, if you want to say uh, everybody lies, I'm, I'm down with that. I'd say mm -hmm. that uh, I'd say that they're both they're both good at the opposite too. I mean, the left has been pushing climate change uh, for how long now? Uh, you know, that's mm -hmm. a huge lie. Mm -hmm. The left isn't it funny? The solution to, every... to everything isn't it funny? The political solution to everything is give us more control over your life and more of your money. Isn't and it yet, it never it? solves anything ever. No, no matter no. which party it swings. How it really yep. works is the left lies to everyone else. The right lies to their own voters. That's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. lies to I get in politics. That. That's mm -hmm. why I, for the most part, dislike all politicians equally. That's fair. With some assessment. exceptions where I dislike you even more than than most of them. Um, Common Sense says, you know, this is for Mike. Uh, Mr. Baron, if you get a chance to write a new Star Wars comic, what, what would you write? Be anything. Jedi, Sith, X-Wing, or Bounty Hunters. Unfortunately, Mike isn't with us. Obviously, he did a lot of great Star Wars stuff. Mm -hmm. Aaron Sparrow, you've been very upset with Star Wars lately. You are a writer. Ooh. You've done licensed work. If you could write a Star Wars comic book, what would it be? Uh, well, first of all, uh, I'd write a Boba Fett Western, and uh, I would write a sequel to the Republic Commando video game uh, where uh, mm -hmm. I would have um, Sev, who disappeared at the end of that game, if you're familiar with Republic Commando, I would have Sev uh, team up with the Bad Batch and uh, try to get his brother, you know, like basically try to get his brothers out of the, uh, the brainwashing of uh, Order 66. Mm. So it would, you know, what just about this? Instead of that mm -hmm. Sith Ewok leader. <laughs> you can make that Wicked. happen. Darth Wicked. <laughs> Listen, I have I have a Star Wars <laughs> I have a Star Wars story that I wanted to do, and once I realized that Star Wars was dead under Disney, um, I basically just uh, started to rework it into my own idea, and uh, and maybe I'll maybe I'll get around to doing that someday. Maybe after uh, after I finish up with everything I want to do with uh, Neil before Doomface, maybe that'll be my. Mm -hmm. So so I'm you can you... do your own version of Rebel Moon. <laughs> Yes, I'll do my own version of Rebel Moon, except it'll be good. <laughs> Aaron, think about it. Darth Adorable. <laughs> no, no, come on. This is modern day. It's going to be Darth Adorbs. Uh... Whatever, man. It all works, man. Everyone <laughs> loves Ewoks, especially when they do evil things like uh, murder stormtroopers. No, one of the things that I had in my story was I had a uh, I had an Ewok mechanic on one of the ships, and he had been taken as a, as a walkling and raised on Nar Shadda and uh, was this like little tough cursing mechanic you know he was just he does was he have any connection to the force no no connection to the force not everybody needs to have a connection to the force wes <laughs> oh, darth adorable you know i know i know that it's really popular now like everybody can be a jedi everybody has the force especially if you're a woman no 
Wraith X7, obviously, uh, a question for Mike Barron. Will we eventually see an animated Nexus movie or TV show? I think he sounds like uh, once they want to show Mike the money, that he's yeah. ready for it. But they've been circling it, but nobody has uh, thrown down the coin quite yet. Show me the Have money. any of you seen the Avengers Confidential Black Widow and Punisher 2014 anime film? It was awesome. Mm, I've seen that. No. Was That's it the one with awesome? the iron. Is that the Did one where the, the, with the iron skull where, where uh, he steals you, the you iron said you saw armor? It. And... Yeah, like that. But if, I, if I'm, 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 I want to know if I'm recalling the right one. I know I've seen it, but um, I, I know there's uh, there's one movie that has where the uh, you've got like the iron skull and the iron taskmaster. They basically have iron man mm-hmm. armor. And I think that's the one. If but it's been years, but I have seen it. Okay, was worthwhile. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was, it was yeah. Good. Okay. Okay. Certainly okay. better Black than Black Widow and Punisher makes sense as a team. I yeah, mean, and the, and the, and the, the level, I could see that as a street yeah, level absolutely. team. Yeah, I could. There's worth she's assassin. He's, a, he's inher- inherently a you know he's he's sort of that could be the selling point. point. She's assassin. He's a serial killer. And they both, <laughs> and they there. both have operated <laughs> under government conspiracies and orders and trying to get out of trouble with them. So, yeah, that actually lines up. The more you actually think about it, the more it does line up. Wait, here's my pitch. Here's my, here's, here's my pitch. Are you ready? Intro. Pitch it. <laughs> Come on, pitch okay, it. here's my pitch. He's a vigilante serial killer. She's an assassin. And now they thought they were looking. For the ultimate bad guy, but instead, what they found is love. Exactly. Oh, yes. sure. <laughs> 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 if I had a few more seconds, I could have polished have that a little Steve bit more. Steve Gutenberg is but... <laughs> the Punisher. Marvel Studios and <laughs> Meg Ryan is Black Widow. It's Marvel Studios and uh, Hallmark. The Touchstone. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Touchstone movie. <laughs> da, 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 da. Do you remember uh, on Saturday Night Live Bird. where they did Ultra, where they did Black Widow, Age of Black, Black Widow, Ultron, Age of Me? <laughs> she like falls in love with Ultron, and it's a romantic comedy. <laughs> no, I do remember Gump Fiction on Mad TV. Thinking that was <laughs> Lade Kramer, I look forward to Aaron's the Acolyte Number One fan made T shirt. <laughs> oh, I'm a mod. Hang on, I can kick. I can kick Lane. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, no. I, I can't wait. To I don't see have that Disney Plus. So, so hard. I that show is gonna be huge bomb. Seriously, well, Iron and I are gonna watch it. At least the first three episodes, and we're gonna have to talk about it. So that'd be fun. I hope, I hope whomever it was made for shows up for it because it was made just for you. It wasn't made for us. <laughs> True Believer says, "Will there be a Bronze Star sequel?" Obviously, Mark uh, or Mike said there would be. Johnny Jamboogie, is it true IDW cut more staff this week? Absolutely, it's true. Yes, really. Ooh, yeah. Can this consolidate until there's one person left, and that person <laughs> it, will change their name to IDW? It'll be it, Heather Antos. It will be, be the last one standing. It's IDW Highlander Games. There can only be one. Very nice, oh, uh, true believer. If the writing sucks, blame the editor that let it go to print. Aaron, you used to be an editor, and I blame you for all the problems in editorial these days. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, uh, you know, unfortunately, I'm not in charge of uh, editorial for most of these things because, uh, you know, here's here's really the truth about like the way that I approach writing, the way that I approach editing, is I- I'm not I'm not here to like change your story necessarily. Um, I just finished a script last night where I made a lot of like dialogue suggestions, but uh, it was all taking the dialogue that existed and saying let's streamline it let's you know kind of repolish it make it sound uh more uh more naturalistic um you know i'm always there to help the writer deliver what their vision is of the book but i will tell you if i think that your vision is bad and 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 like you know like hey here's you know you've written this but your real story is here like i think this is where you need to be and and trim off this stuff you know I'll, i'll always give you um the the best advice i can to help you get the best version of your story out there uh, and i think like an editor that, Yes. I heard, would you uh, ever yeah. tell somebody this entire concept is so bad we shouldn't move forward with it? We should scrap it and start over. I, have I think if Aaron to, told if Aaron told Tom King this of. is not good, Tom King would go cry to his wife saying that Aaron was being mean. No, to him. Tom King well, would give go and talk to DC Comics and get <laughs> fired. That's what he did. You so mean, you're hired crazy. to tell writers it's to like Mark Doyle told him his story was bad either. He just told him. No, we can't hire that that artist because he's on vacation. We need to get someone else to draw the cover. And he got mm. him fired for that. Tom King threw, threw a tantrum. I understand it. 
Yeah. So <laughs> it's all editors, editorial's fault. It's it's Aaron's fault. Blade says, I think Mike could write an awesome Sinestro book. I agree. I agree. Yeah. I love Sinestro. He's such a good character. Mm-hmm. Ooh, he can kill a bunch of human lanterns, too. There you go. You've been looking forward to that. I know. But you, you can only kill like certain lanterns because it would be a hate crime if you if you killed all like all the lanterns, you know. Not all. No, 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 no. We 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 can kill them all. <laughs> like God sort them out. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> DC definitely has a problem. With, they've made all their superhero families too big. Well, the that's Batman a... family is too big. The Flash family is too big. The Green Lantern. I think there's a, I think mm-hmm. you hit on a, a big issue. And no, I don't read current DC, but from a lot of my friends at the comic shop that I go to read current DC, mm-hmm. it's, and tell me if I'm wrong, but it sounds mm-hmm. like from what almost all of them tell me is that it seems like almost every book is a team book. Every book has a family, that's for sure. Yeah. I mean, like I'm waiting for Aquaman to have a more robust family, and they're going there. I mean, apparently oh, Arthur and Mera have a daughter now. Yes, because they all they all have daughters now. That's another thing that's becoming a Arthur thing. isn't supposed to be having sons. Mm. They stopped having sons. Now it's all about having a daughter. Now if they do have a son, he's going to be gay. Mm-hmm. But they're, they're, well, the daughter's going to be point. gay too. It's fine. They might as well rename all these books because it's clear they want to make the money off the name, even though these books are you know somewhat false advertising. Because if it's like they say, okay, well, I don't like this core character, so I got to add all these art characters. And right around the main character, I'm mm-hmm. not interested in those types of books. Like, even if the book is decent, it's just like if I want to get a Superman con, I want a Superman con. Now, if you're gonna have a frequent mm-hmm. supporting cast, okay, sure, Lois and John, fine, right. but it shouldn't have to have Supergirl, Superwoman, so, Superboy, well, over and, and over every action single issue. Action's more oriented to the Superman family. Well, well, Superman seems to be just. Very focused on it's the Lex Luthor family. Yes, <laughs> um, there you go too. Yeah, well, exactly. well they right. already have super feet people, bat people, right. green people. Now they get water people. It's yeah. too much of every thing. Doc, right? uh, what you believer wants to know wasn't the Punisher originally an ex cop turned vigilante? I thought the special ops backstory was a retcon that came later. As far as I'm aware, yes, because I, I think, think whatever right. they. I, I think he was just like a detective. He was, you know, run of the mill detective, um, whose family got killed, and he went on a vengeance streak. Mm-hmm. I think all the the the, the Vietnam the the Nam stuff got added later. The special forces stuff got added later. I, I a lot of it kind of started getting added around, if if memory serves, around the time that they did it in the the Thomas Jane Punisher movie. Uh, because they made him former military turned FBI mm-hmm. in that movie. So I think they added a lot of that shit. Later. I hated that movie. I know. Well, hey, come on. We got to see uh, Travolta chewing scenery. He was better in Swordfish. He was. It was. We I, got to see big, big, sexy Kevin Nash. <laughs> As, <laughs> yeah. Actually get stabbed on on. Uh, ah, on yeah. <laughs> The yep. Russian, <laughs> and, and, and and he didn't even. Uh, but that time he didn't have to take you know a six week break. Um, <laughs> he didn't. He didn't. Well, it's because he didn't get stabbed in the quad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. But no. Yeah. That that movie's. But I think a lot of the retcon and the additions they started in the in the two thousands. Mm-hmm. Um. He was just a cop before then. Mm-hmm. Very nice. Appreciate everybody. Uh, what do we want to talk about? We want to talk about Roy Thomas. We want to talk about these X Men details. Reed Landon, what do you guys want to hit? Yes, yes, yes. That it. that's that's the answer. Yes. Well, we aren't yes. going to get to all of it. Yeah. We're going to get we to, have one, to pick more the one of them. Okay, I'll so, pick the one of them. I think. I mean, I think, you and Doc, I think you and Doc did a good. I think you and Doc did a good job kicking Roy Thomas's ass. Uh, oh so goodness. let's. Uh, yeah, let's let's. All let's, right. Well, we got our demo. details for the X Men reboot. It turns out we're going to get eighteen issues of X Men, eighteen issues of Uncanny X Men. Uh, they don't even mention exceptional X Men. Mm-hmm. X Men or, or Uncanny X Men, I guess, is going to be a gothic southern horror tale, which makes a whole lot of sense for that. And we've got all this stuff uh, lining up. And of course, we're going to get the Rachel and Betsy Braddock relationship continuing. Doc. And a lot of this feels like the same old X Men reboot because I, it I, is. It I was. A it question was. For Doc. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. 
Is Rachel still from a future where she's married to Franklin Richards? Uh, yes. As a matter of okay. fact, she is. All right. And it doesn't seem to matter because okay. um, now she's gay. Exactly. And, okay, thank uh, you. Um, so, no, what, what, what we'll do is we'll get to the future again and Franklin, and we'll find out that somewhere off panel, uh, Franklin Richards reality warped himself into having a vagina. Um, that's that's how they'll make it work. And Says he's some, Chambers. Yeah, and he's somehow now, um, you know, Frankie Richards. Um, I, I don't know what the female version of Franklin is. Uh, so, no, yeah, it's look. This is this is one hundred percent absolutely same old, same old bullshit. Uh-huh. X Men. They have no interest in changing. The editorial department did not want to change. DC, or I'm sorry, Disney likely came down a little bit on on Marvel, and Mm -hmm. Kevin Feige came down on C.B. Sobolski and um, Dan Buckley and said, fucking fix this. We're going to be introducing the X-Men in the goddamn movie soon. Mm -hmm. We can't have it being a 15,000 an issue seller when it should be 150,000 an issue seller. You can't cut it down to ten percent of its market. So they're like, okay, well, we have to, we have to change course. That just means firing everybody and doing the same shit. Yeah, it just means it just means reboot with new number ones and, and relaunch the line. But it's same same crap, same uh, same terrible editorial, same uh, you know lack of vision. Uh, you know, Tom Brevoort has said on more than one occasion he's never cared about the X Men. He doesn't care now. The guy's just mm-hmm. running out the clock on his career. He has no passion mm-hmm. for this anymore. I mean, it's just it's a bunch of people in that company that have been there too long that or that have well. Actually, even the people that are new hires have been there too long. Uh, with the oh, yeah. pool. You know, this this company needs a purge from the top to the bottom. It needs new creative brought in. It needs people brought in who actually care. And it needs some people with balls that say, I'm going to hire the best people. And I don't care if Twitter doesn't like their political affiliation. I don't mm-hmm. care if Twitter doesn't like, you know, um, you know what they uh, what they've written in the past. I don't really give a crap what Twitter says. The people that don't buy these books anyway, the people that just pirate them online. Well, we don't even buy the books because Disney supports uh, supports Israel. Whatever. We don't need you. Just scream into the void. You know, yeah. we're, what we're focused on is we're focused on customers with money. That is the only thing that matters. Customers who and actually don't... care about the stories. Yeah. No, just no, customers that... with money. Return, <laughs> return customers. Yes. Customers with money that will come back every month. I, it, mm-hmm. on, on, Marvel look, is I... no longer going to be inclusive. Marvel is going to be exclusive. They you, know what the level of exclu- you know what the level of exclusivity is? Talent. I don't care what your political affiliation is, what your sexuality is, what your personal beliefs are, what your religion is. I don't give a shit about any of that. Are you a good writer? Can you write a good story? Can you put butts in the seats? Can you sell books? That is the level of exclusivity that every single company needs to aim for. And I am tired of pretending that it is a big party for everybody to come in, regardless of, of, you know, their lack of talent. You know, we just need to check these boxes. No, the box we're checking is talent. Oh, yeah. No, it's the the cash register. Ka-ching. The irony is that is that um, they 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 are they aren't letting just everyone in, even though because they're letting in people who they want uh, affiliated. They they let they basically not to get Mike Barron punny, but they have Florida man their whole entire process where they just stop taking everything about it seriously from top to bottom. Because you know when I first started noticing some of these issues, I guess I could say I didn't really take it seriously. It's just like oh maybe it's just something I'm I'm saying. And then I start repeating, and I saw more books that started having issues. I thought, man, what's going on here? It was really confusing at the time before I discovered, I guess, other people who felt the same way I did on YouTube. And I'm like, and I would look, I'm like, okay, this is weird. And then I would see, then all of a sudden I came to YouTube. I see, like, oh, it's like this with the editorial. I saw uh, YouTube and Twitter, the editors were like this too. I'm like, holy crap, this is a, this is a top to bottom filth here. This so is not like it's just one or two guys. These are, this is almost, everyone and that's not an exaggeration it's almost everyone in the big two unfortunately you are probably the most optimistic of of the panel of anybody that's that's ever on the show and and you're you're very optimistic in general about comics you know and and moving into the future does this tell you that it's changing in any way other than titles 
No, no, not really, because it's uh, they haven't gone back to the mansion. They haven't gone back to the danger room, I guess. They're doing I like this. Uh, they're doing the outback again in a way, like I think tonally. Like, but, you know, Doc but are they? Yeah, I, I, I love the outback. And I think most people do. Um, yep. uh, I don't amen. think tonally this is really the outback because. Well, it's a diaspora. It's like because it's once again we're not we don't have a centralized kind of location. We don't have a mansion. We don't have a danger room. We don't have that the old familiar trappings to fall back on, which but, also could have been Krakoa, the island itself too. Now you have. Well, but you know, like you know, when you look at the Outback era, it was only one of three titles that that wasn't in New York. New Mutants was still at the mansion. X Factor was in New York City. Wolverine was well, he was everywhere. Um, <laughs> but but the X-Men, the uncanny book was the only one that wasn't at the mansion or or in New York. Now you're you're again, they're they're trying to avoid going back to New York because I feel like that was it would be an admission to them that that they were wrong. That they were wrong, that the four years, five years that they spent avoiding being there mm -hmm. was was a mistake and oh we have to reset so they're resetting by not resetting um it, it's their it's their thumb in the eye of you know the readers the people that they pushed away the comic shops even kevin feige that told them to fucking fix it um make it something that anybody wants to buy okay fine we'll get away from we'll get away from orgy island and we'll go to orgy sentinel building i love that <laughs> We'll, we'll go to orgy orgy sentinel factory we'll go to orgy college orgy um, or, or, oh, <laughs> uh, oh wait orgy orgy coffee shop i'm sorry oh that's right Kitty's yeah, a no. fucking barista now oh, um <laughs> they, they'll they'll go to to orgy haunted vampire cemetery mm -hmm. you know that's the I'm super, right. I, look, yeah. I don't know about you, Doc, but I am super excited to read Kitty's Adventures in a job that uh, most of the writers on X-Men should have. <laughs> yes, I, I am, too, um, because this is look, I mean, here, here's the thing. You know, Leah Williams, the only thing she ever was able to write competently was being the assistant to the assistant to the assistant on the back lot of a movie studio in the Mary Jane book. Amazing um, Mary Jane yeah, that's the only thing that she, because that's what she knew. So now we're getting a bunch of people that are glorified baristas getting to write yeah. a barista book. So, so maybe it'll be competent. I mean, it won't be fun, but it, it won't. It you'll won't definitely be know what it's like to make coffee all for eight Yeah, hours. you'll definitely know. You know, if you guys were were worried, we we're wondering about that. I mean, we used to have stories that you know of uh, of great heroism and sacrifice, but now we'll know <laughs> what it is to uh, you know to have to remake somebody's order because uh, which is their actual life experience. That is their life experience, and that's why they take such like um, uh -huh. serious <laughs> offense to when we you know bash their self insert because you're not bashing the character, you're bashing them. Oh yeah, You're bashing them and and deservedly so because mm -hmm. it shows but, you that they can't okay. even challenge themselves to think outside of their bubble. Well, I I I was gonna ask though. Here's the thing: I feel like you know this is kind of harking back to something Aaron said earlier about you know these books have to be exclusive um, instead of inclusive. I, I think they are exclusive. They're just excluding anyone with talent. Yeah, <laughs> you're not wrong. So, or money. Aaron, so we know that they're going to introduce four new members to Uncanny X-Men, a team with Wolverine, Jubilee, Rogue, uh, is it Rogue, or Gambit, and yeah, then obviously yeah. uh, you've got Nightcrawler in there as well. Some really heavy hitter established X-Men characters, mm. and they're just going to throw four new characters onto the book from the get-go? That shit's yeah. never going to work. People don't care about your new character. They care about Wolverine. They want to hear about what Gambit's doing in his old stop and ground. They're going to want to know about Nightcrawler. Well, listen, it's just all these characters are failure. Every one of these established characters is going to tell the new characters what big fans of them they are and how, well, how yeah. they think they're great. So, so therefore, those characters will get over, right? Because that's how it works. You know, we've had uh, no. we've had how many years of uh, of characters validating Miss Marvel and Captain Marvel, and those books are top sellers, right? They never have to be relaunched. They're just they're going strong. They're on like their three hundredth issue. Uh, well, they're oh, oh, oh wait, no, that none of that happens. Is it is it necessary? But here's the question that I have. You already have exceptional X Men, which is going to be introducing four new fucking mutants. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why do you need it to happen in Uncanny as well? 
They're, so they're introducing literally on three books. And these are least, disability stock. Yes, at they're not least, as obvious as popping claws, even though Wolverine doesn't walk around with paws claws popped. Okay. Yeah. Um, they're hidden disabilities because you know, Cyclops's optic blast totally not fucking hidden. Um well his aren't because if he doesn't wear those glasses, he would be blasting everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where it would be. So, so, I mean, there's a overt disability. Where it's pretty obvious, you know, with Nightcrawler and stuff. But most of the X-Men you can't even tell unless they use them. Yeah. What's this book from E viewing called again? I, I forgot. That's the, the, that's the exceptional X-Men. Exceptional, exceptional X Men. <laughs> See the, the exceptional X Men, that's a type of book you're supposed to release if you want to really emphasize on new characters when your X-Men market is very healthy, when you got your core characters, your top characters, whether it's solo books or team books are doing well, you can take chances on books like that. You're like, okay, hey, look at all these books here. Because then, you know, it's kind of, once again, kind of brings it back to when Mark said on here many moons back, when Marvel does to do well, you know, it makes me want to check out the indies. That type of X-Men book is something you're supposed to put out when you have a good, healthy X-Men yeah. market. But they're putting that out at, in a market that is, very unhealthy for this book and consider it a top flagship book now because now flagship to them is now a construct because it to know flagship is one book it's not multiple books sorry tom but not sorry at all like yeah you you just want because you'll want the idea that oh well we have to accept these other books if i know well, that mm. means you have no vision and you don't care about actually having a, a, a thing that actually represents your um, X Men line. It's me. It's just whatever the wires want it to be at that moment in time, even if it contradicts it five minutes later, which they will. Exceptional, exceptional X Men can exist mm -hmm. the same way that New Mutants existed. New Mutants, yeah. When that's what I'm getting when yeah. when it was able to spin out from the success of Uncanny and X Factor, which spun out from the success of Uncanny, which then begot Generation X, which then begot Young young X-Men, which then begot the other New Mutants title with the New Mutants Academy X that became yeah. New X-Men. Um, that's all whenever the line is strong. And then you end up, of course, even when they did it with fucking Wolverine and the X-Men and goddamn Eye Boy and Shark Girl and all those other terrible creators or uh, characters. Um, uh, all right, Doc, it, you're going to have to wrap it up here, buddy. My point is you could do it when the line is strong. They try. Yeah. This we, is not a strong line. That's true. True yeah, Believer says DC needs a Lex Luthor family. Let's men. I think it works, Aaron. You. Da -na 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 -na. Da -na -na -na. I'd buy a bald so guy. Aaron, I mean, come on. How can you not yeah, mine? there's a bald guy. Give him give him a wheelchair and we're good. <laughs> uh definitely love seeing yellow flash in here. How you doing, brother? And Aaron, you are gonna be departing hey, us soon. Yeah, unfortunately, um, I now have uh, stuff that I have to do at ten o'clock, so um, I can't uh, I can't do the overruns like we normally do. So I am going to have to say goodbye for today. But uh, thanks to everyone in the chat, and uh, uh, you guys can uh, come uh, yell at me on Twitter. Are you going to recommend any yeah. X books or comic books? Uh, no, because I'm picking them up today. You know, I'm a, I'm a Saturday uh, pickup guy. Uh, so we'll see what's uh, we'll see what's waiting for me in my poll. But uh, I will recommend this since we were talking uh, in the chat about uh, the old. Uh, D, D figures. Once again, I just want to recommend Mythic Legions figures, and uh, here is a custom Bullywug that I'm working on for my little uh, my little Bullywug frog army. So uh, there you go. That's my recommendation That's for the nice. week. Go buy go buy some Four Horsemen Mythic Legion figures. Very nice. Really appreciate that one, Aaron. Uh, Sully, you are the most optimistic aficionado. You're the yeah uh, puppy dogs and ice cream aficionado. Indeed. You recommend any books? I, you know, usually I'm armed with a bag of fresh comic books from my local comic book shop every week. You know, this is the ubiquitous brown paper bag. Sometimes you get a plastic bag, but uh, this is what we get here. And uh, But I'm picking it up later today. I got a pull list going for the first time in like two decades. But one thing I wanted to point out that like, okay, over the past two months, Marvel has gotten an extra $31 out of me. I And we're talking about X-Men comics. I'm a lifelong X-Men fan. I am a sucker for these facsimile issues. And they're usually about, they're charging us their usual cover price, $4.99. Yeah. You know what I mean? But they're direct reprints 
with ads, letter pages. I mean, seven ninety nine. Except for that, but it's not square bound, so fuck that. No, no, no. It's just it's 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 a, it's a floppy. And yeah, but that, that, that that giant size should be square bound. Mm, if it's a yeah. facsimile, that's and a true. Full copy. There. Yeah. And uh, these were the first two comics I ever bought uh, from uh, off the wall in my old comic book shop when I was like 12 or 13. Bucks. The first I mean, comic you ever bought was Days of Future Past. No, I mean, like off the, the a wall comic. Oh, you know, I was were, about like, to say, you aren't you the lucky men? No, I mean, <laughs> these were like 20 bucks each behind the counter on the wall. And I was in love with these comics. These are like totally long gone. And that first comic book collection my mother threw out, she had no idea what I had. And um, this, it's nice to have these. This is this is a real you know time machine. So yeah, I mean, check out all the facsimile co copies available at your local comic book shop. I like those. Very nice. Did you have Rook Exodus on your pull list this week? I didn't, but I read it. Jason Fabok really tore that up. I, I loved that book. Well, and it's you could have recommended the book. It's good. I I I, I uh, <laughs> out, of the, out of the three Ghost Machines, I would say that uh, Rook Exodus was the best. Yes. By the way. Too. Hey, uh, Poison Ivy 21. Don't sleep on Poison Ivy. It's G. Willow Wilson. We're usually, you know, we make fun of all the girl writers and rightfully so here and there, but we never talk about G. Willow Wilson. She's doing the yeoman's work over on Poison Ivy. The art's been consistently good, and I'm really liking her story. She's she's a really decent comic book writer, and uh, don't sleep on Poison Ivy. It's good. Hey, I will add to what Sully said here. On those facsimile editions, the, definitely pick them up. However, I will warn everybody, and I will personally come to your house and kick you in the nuts if you do it. Do not, do not, do not support the bullshit variant covers that they're slapping on these facsimile editions. The modern variant on a facsimile of a book from the 80s or the 70s or the 60s, if you do it, and keep supporting it. I'm going to come to your house and kick you in the fucking balls. Mm -hmm. All right. There we go. Let's up. We do have 32 flavors of Nick Weiser, the man behind the crash test dummies. Are you <laughs> recommending oh, okay. So here, here are my uh, recommendations. So uh, for old school, I'm going to do um, straight up guys, read planetary from Warren Nelson, John Cassidy, me and Wes have been covering it on, on, um, the comics guild on the uh, Patreon and it has blown my mind. I am someone who's not familiar with that book. And if you've already read it, we'll read it again. I bought the giant fat uh, omnibus of it and I have been reading it. You no, know, as I've gone along with Wes and it's, it has blown my mind in terms of story and art, how good it is. as far as uh new school. I really, um, as far as I did buy the ghost machine books, all of them, I did enjoy all of them, but I'm going to be the um, very honest contrarian. And th my personal favorite was Redcoat. I love the character Simon Pierre. I thought he was awesome, and I love Brian Hitch's art as well. On top of it, I will I will stand by that. And my last quick recommendation, because Mike M, my friend in the chat, he's a he's a nice man who asked for a recommendation. Look up as far as metal goes. Look up the band Traveler. They have an album called Prequel to Madness. It is very old school, traditional heavy metal. I saw them a few weeks ago in Texas, and they were absolutely awesome. So, Traveler. What about Metallica S and M? That doesn't exist. Oh come, come on, Metallica Dude. With SM, great. No. Metallica with the symphony. Dude, no. I got that for my mother. She loves it. No, She's a she can love it all she wants. That's fine. But for me, <laughs> Traveler is that is the way of all life. That young band, good band too, and they should definitely be getting more recognition. So there you go, Mike Amp. Hope you're happy. And for the comics gurus, old school, new school, I got you all covered. So thanks for having me. It's a fun show. Oh, shout out to Mike Barron too. I, I love Florida Man versus Hogzilla. Right. There's your bonus <laughs> recommend. Florida Man versus uh, Hogzilla good. was straight up laugh out loud funny. I Highly recommend it. Gary Duba is a great character. And I'm just going to give one hint. He's got a character as a wrestler, and her name is Black Dildo. Just saying. That's how funny Florida Man is. So. Very nice. Doc, <laughs> you are our final here. You got any recommendations for comic books? Well, sort of. I am going to do something a little different. First, we're going to start out. This is going to be a Punisher Appreciation 
recommendation. Nothing new, obviously. And we're going to start out with this old fucking action figure. It was, <laughs> I had, you could put uh, caps. Remember those string oh, yes. caps? Absolutely. And you could put them up here and make him, make his gun shoot and make it, you hear it? Here? Yes. Yep. Oh my god, I can smell the caps too. <laughs> Remember the little red things? Yes, they had a little little odor to them. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So we'll start with that, and then we will go to the recommendations. So we're gonna start with Spider-Man. I think this is 131. It's like the second or third appearance of, of uh Ooh, the Punisher. I think it says 162. Yeah. Oh, oh no, it's 160 something. Yeah, sorry, uh, but it's it's. I think it's only like the third appearance of the Punisher, um, and it has Nightcrawler in it for 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 Wes since that's his favorite. I love character. Nightcrawler. That's my I guy. Know. I know. So you have Spider Man, Nightcrawler, and the Punisher, all in one comic, and um, you know early appearance. So I'm recommending it. It's a fun fun story. Then we will go with now. This is just this is a book you can find in your dollar bins. I just love this comic. Jim Lee art, Punisher War Journal. He oh, steals man. a ski. He steals somebody's jet ski <laughs> and has to go. He's like on a jet ski adventure shooting shit. This is it's a ridiculous, simple, fun, stupid story. Jim Lee interior and cover art. Um, this would have been, oh, what would have probably been 1988 to 89. Um, right before he ends up moving over to X-Men. Uh, this is one of his last few issues. So, and you can definitely see that art style is more, you know, X-Men Jim Lee than Alpha Flight Jim Lee. So we'll go with that. And then finally, we will go with a bigger Ooh, book. Uh, Punisher, Punisher number one from the miniseries, um, you know, it's oh, yeah. it's a classic cover, the the Mike Zek cover. Um, you know, there's been a number of homages to it, mm -hmm. especially that uh what if Spider-Man was the Punisher one from a couple of years ago? Mm -hmm. Uh I think that I believe that was the Brian Edward Hill story. But regardless, um good, you know, great story, and it was the first Punisher solo book. Yeah. Um you know, yeah, this miniseries, and then the ongoing series that actually did start as a second mini series. So definitely recommend this. That was such a surprise, like seeing that as a kid on the, on I the shelves. I mean, it, when then you had four of four and then you had five of five and they just stapled on. They were like, like, Oh wow. That's so cool. I mean, it was in middle school, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I Very mean, nice. It was, it was great. Whenever this is back in the day where, Marvel would introduce things as a mini series, and when they got successful, they just became an ongoing instead of being announced as an ongoing, and then they graduate to mini series because they don't sell at all. Yeah, it's a little bit of a different like one exceptional there. X Men. <laughs> I do want to say thank you very much, obviously, to Mike Baird and Aaron Sparrow who had to dip out a little bit early. Had lots of fun here. Thank you to the chats. Uh, it looked like there's a couple people engaging in some debates, but for the most part, we are just geeking out. And that's what we want to do here. And thank you very much to everyone for supporting me and all that good stuff. Definitely check out the Patreon if you haven't yet. Lots of great stuff with uh, Doc, Nick Weiser, Jim, Aaron Sparrow, all on there. As well as uh, everybody have a great weekend. And we'll see you next time. There's something else I wanted to talk about. Oh, yeah. Drew and I will be giving our comic book recommendations. And there will be multiple books from, from Ghost Machine, not surprisingly, in there. They kind of save the week uh, to a degree. Can I say something real quick? Uh, don't miss out on Wes's interview with R.T. Bear. I watched it this morning. It's a good, uh, that's some great time spent. It's all deep comic book talk. You're going to love it. That was, a, that was a fun interview because I didn't have to do much. Dude, until he he'd finished a point, and then I would put out a little nugget, and then he'd tell like five more awesome stories. Oh, gosh. And that I was just time hang well back and listen. That was great, Wes. Thank you for sharing that with us. That was, was a great it, time. Thank you. Mm. Get out. Good weekend, everybody. Leave. See ya. Leave now.